I'm certainly happy to have further discussions with the organisations and uh, Glasgow City Council and, and looking whether that's feasible. Many thanks. That concludes question time. I may now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 10724 in the name of Keith Brown on Trident. We are tight for time this afternoon. Members in the open debate will already have been advised that speeches are now of five minutes duration. I would also therefore ask opening speakers if they could be as brief as possible in the time allocated to them. Any time that we save in opening speeches may be used then in the open debate. I call on Keith Brown to speak to and to move the motion. Minister, you have 14 minutes maximum in which to do so. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. It is my belief that it is extremely important that we consider the issues raised in this motion, which I now move for a number of critical reasons. First of all, to consider the current opportunity to remove these obscenely destructive and indiscriminate weapons from Scotland forever. Then to consider the findings of the recent Trident Commission report uh, produced last month, which included the determination of the three main Westminster parties to proceed with Trident replacement and also the massive costs associated with that decision. And finally, to consider the impact of these costs, currently estimated at over £100 billion at 2012 prices, eh, on the expenditure that we make on conventional defence eh, equipment specifically and on future budgets generally. Each of these issues is crucial to Scotland's future, and it is therefore extremely important that this Parliament considers these issues. Uh, presenting us for six weeks tomorrow, uh, we will have the opportunity, the people of Scotland will have the opportunity to decide if Scotland will once again take its place as an independent country. And that choice, which I fully expect the people of Scotland to embrace, comes with this government's commitment to secure the removal of Trident nuclear weapons from an independent Scotland. Uh, I know that the Scottish Government and, of course, my party are absolutely determined to seize the opportunity to begin in six weeks' time the discussions that will lead to the removal of nuclear weapons from Scotland. And I cannot believe that, in addition to the SNP and to the Green members and others in this chamber, that there are not others in other parties who would not be excited by that project, including amongst them lifelong campaigners against nuclear weapons. Who would not be excited by the prospect, eh, whatever their views on constitutional change, eh, of getting rid of nuclear weapons, especially given the alternative, of course, which is a lifetime spent under the shadow of a new generation of nuclear weapons eh, and delivery systems and the yoke of their massive cost. Eh, presiding officer, the vast majority of countries in the world neither have nor want nuclear weapons. Of the 139, sorry, 193 United Nations uh, member states, independent states, it's believed that fewer than 10 possess nuclear warheads or aspire to do so. And of the five states who currently host US nuclear weapons, three have stated their wish to see them removed. Uh, the Scottish Government is a firm supporter of the Treaty on the Non-Proliferation of Nuclear Weapons. And while some may question the success of the treaty and the ultimate aim of securing the reduction of nuclear arms, the NPT provides a clear basis for the international management and control of nuclear material, technologies and information. But we must now build on that framework in order to take the next step. The Scottish Government therefore believes that rather than renewing and further developing their nuclear weapon systems, nuclear weapon states need to focus their efforts towards nuclear non-proliferation and disarmament. And that's why, when we debated this issue in March of last year, the Scottish Government proposed a motion which endorsed the five-point plan for nuclear disarmament set out by UN Secretary-General Ban Ki-moon. And that plan builds on the NPT and calls on nuclear and non-nuclear weapon states to fulfil their obligations under the treaty to pursue negotiations leading to disarmament. And I'm glad to say that during that debate, the majority of this chamber supported that motion. And with that context, I would turn to the UK Government's plans for the renewal of Trident nuclear weapons. The Prime Minister has said that in 2016, the UK Government will decide whether or not to replace the Trident submarine fleet. But this decision, which prepares for Trident missiles with nuclear warheads being passed on the Clyde through to 2060 and beyond, could have massive implications for the UK's conventional defence forces. And yet, if you look at the position of the three main parties at Westminster, the so-called Trident main gate decision appears to have already been made. Both coalition parties and Labour have signalled their support for a new fleet of submarines carrying Trident ballistic missiles, with questions only around the size of the fleet and whether nuclear weapons uh, should be on patrol continuously. And I think it's particularly important for those Labour backbenchers who feel very strongly about nuclear disarmament to understand uh, that the potential other option, the alternative, 
is the basing of massively powerful nuclear weapons and the delivery systems in central Scotland for the next 50 years or more. That's the alternative to what we propose. And of course, the UK government, uh, the current UK government, sticks to their line that it has no plans to move those weapons from uh, HMNB Clyde. But we believe that information which is critical to that decision, information on the costs and the consequences for the future of the UK's armed forces, has not been made available either to MPs at Westminster or indeed to the general public. On the 1st of July, the Trident Commission, a cross-party inquiry led by representatives of the three main Westminster parties, published its concluding report. And while I disagree strongly with their support for the UK retaining nuclear weapons, I was very concerned by their comments on the cost of Trident renewal and by the impact that these costs could have on conventional defence personnel and equipment. The UK government has provided estimates, estimates only, on the capital costs for replacing the submarine fleet, which carries its nuclear weapons, and also for extending the life of the Trident missile and other infrastructure and warhead developments. And according to the Trident Commission's report, that alone comes to a cost of £50.6 billion in 2012 prices. And on Trident running costs, the Trident Commission estimates an annual in-service outlay of around £1.5 billion in 2012 prices. Over an assumed operational lifetime of 35 years, this suggests a further £52.5 billion in running costs, taking the total potential cost of the UK Government's Trident successor programme to over £100 billion at 2012 prices. And the Trident Commission's overall financial assessment, which discounts future costs, suggests that the annual net present value of the Trident replacement system would average £2.9 billion per year. And that's the equivalent of spending 9% of the UK's current defence budget on nuclear weapons each year. Incidentally, it equates also to between 20 and 30% of the entire capital budget of all three services. However, as construction of the successor submarine fleet reaches its peak, the an actual annual cash costs are projected to be even higher than this, at almost £4 billion a year by the mid-2020s, at 2012 prices. As the Trident Commission recognises, this will, and I quote, place a heavy strain on MOD's capital budget in the period 2018 to 2030, between 20 and 30 per cent of the whole defence capital budget shared between the three services will be spent on Trident renewal. And of course, if you look at the appalling cost overruns, which tend to be typical of the MOD's projects, if you look at, for example, the UK aircraft carrier programme, went from £3 billion to £6 billion in the bat of an eye, then nobody really expects that the figures which I've just mentioned in relation to renewal of Trident will stay static. And that concern is echoed by the comments of Professor Malcolm Chalmers at the Royal United Services Institute, who in January 2013 said that sharp increases in spending on Trident renewal in the early 2020s seem set to mean further years of austerity for conventional equipment plans. Austerity for conventional equipment plans. And that means, by and large, amongst other things, of course, uh, not enough helicopter support, not enough personal equipment for the troops, and perhaps not even enough troops uh, themselves. That's what part of the price of Trident is. And the report goes further, saying that important defence projects currently in the pipeline will surely suffer delay or cancellation, and even more worryingly that the retaining the deterrent could negatively impact on other valuable security and defence capabilities. So it's clear that renewing Trident uh, nuclear weapons will impact on future defence equipment procurement, equipment like the T-26 global, uh, global combat ships, which will be needed by forces at home and overseas. In this last respect, the Scottish Government supports the Trident Commission's conclusion that the UK Government needs to be transparent about the cost of the public, uh, public purse. So a decision which commits to spending over £100 billion of taxpayers' money has major consequences for future defence contracts. And it comes at the expense of conventional defence capabilities. And it's also been taken without transparency on the costs and the impacts on other areas of defence spending. Yes, I will. Jack Bailey. Making an intervention. Um, it's been stated quite clearly by Angus Robertson that savings from Trident will go into conventional defence, something repeated by Alex Salmond in his speech to the SNP conference in October 2012. Does he agree? Minister, you're approaching your last minute. I think uh, Jackie Bailey has already had uh, the answer to that question, which is in the white paper, which says that we will spend £2.5 billion a year in Scotland on defence. That compares to what we currently pay, which is £3.3 billion, even though only £1.7 billion for the last year that records are available was spent in Scotland. So we can both save on the budget and spend more on defence in Scotland, which seems to me a pretty good solution for the people of Scotland. Minister, uh, Minister I do apologise. You do, of course, have 14 minutes. Thank you, President. <laughs> 
Hey, that's why. <laughs> hey, on the 8th of July, and I'll go on a bit further if I can, um, <laughs> the Deputy First Minister wrote to the Prime Minister calling for the true costs of trying to renewal to be made clear to the public, and that includes transparency on the future UK defence projects, which could be delayed, scaled back or cancelled in order to fund the replacement programme. And to date, we have still received no reply to that letter. And it's also why I believe that this Parliament should support the Government motion today for such critical information to be made available to defence personnel, to industry and business, to MPs and MSPs, and most importantly, of course, to the public. Indeed, the call for greater transparency... Uh, yes, I will. Neil Finlay. Is it not a bit rich, the Minister lecturing, lecturing other people about transparency in the finances, when people ask him and his government about the transparency of the finances for an independent Scotland were rebuffed at every time. Minister. Uh, I, I think there's, there's a point at which you can provide information for people who don't want to see that information, who won't acknowledge information. Uh, we provided uh, substantial information both in the White Paper and elsewhere on that. But I would have thought that Neil Finlay would have been concerned about the lack of transparency from the UK government on renewing Trident nuclear weapons. We've not had a word uh, from Neil Finlay on that issue, which I think is unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, 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 indeed, that call for greater transparency in the nuclear uh, weapons programme is more pressing when you consider, of course, again, something we've heard nothing from uh, Neil Finlay on. The UK government has recently updated the UK-US mutual defence agreement including with regard to the transfer of nuclear weapons information, technology and material, without informing even the House of Commons. In fact, the only reason it came to light because President Obama had to report to Congress. That's how we found out about it. Surely, some people in this chamber, other than the government benches, must be concerned about that lack of transparency. And, of course, the Scottish Government expects to be preparing for independence in 2016. And a vote for independence is the only option that comes with a commitment to secure the withdrawal of nuclear weapons from Scotland. And, Presiding Officer, it's this Government's aim for Trident to be withdrawn from Scotland within the first term of the Scottish Parliament following independence. We believe that this is achievable and we look forward to sitting down with the UK Government to discuss that detailed timetable and to agree the arrangements. And I can assure the Chamber and the public that we will approach those discussions responsibly and that we'll work closely with the UK Government to manage the withdrawal of Trident safely and securely. And with regards to HMNB Clyde itself, the Scottish Government will maintain Fars Lane as an independent Scotland's main naval base and as a home to our Joint Forces headquarters. The number of military personnel numbers based there will continue at around current levels, and Fars Lane's conventional naval and forces HQ roles will support significant numbers of civilian personnel. And we have given a commitment to work with the Westminster Government. I will in, in, in a second or two. And we have a, given a commitment to work with the Westminster Government in order to preserve continuity of employment for all staff during that trans transition. I give way to Jackie Bailey. Jackie Bailey. I thank the Minister for giving way. Can I ask him specifically how many naval jobs and how many civilian jobs to support those naval jobs would be at Fasley? Minister. Well, the crucial point, of course, is saying that we would retain those jobs because the number of naval jobs changes over time, as she is well aware, as do the number of civilian jobs. So what we have said is we will retain the same number of military jobs based at joint uh, headquarters for a Scottish Defence Force there and also have the associated civilian jobs. And if you consider that under the UK, we have now reduced around 11,000 armed forces personnel in Scotland and our intention is to have 15,000 armed forces personnel, you can see that what we intend is an expansion of the armed forces rather than the issuing of P45s to people in the front line as takes place at the current time. Minister, you're now approaching your last minute. There will be some who say that maintaining Trident at any cost is a price worth paying in order to protect our national security, and I disagree. And I support the view of the former UN weapons inspector Hans Blix, who has commented that he does not consider Britain to be more protected by Trident, and who also notes quite correctly that other countries, for example Germany or Japan, are managing quite well without nuclear weapons. That is why I believe that this Parliament should signal its opposition to the renewal of Trident nuclear weapons and commit to working with nuclear and non-nuclear states in the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. Uh, Presiding officer, Scotland's population share of the equivalent annual cost for the Trident replacement programme equates to around £240 million per annum. And just to put that in a bit of perspective, that is more than we spend on the concessionary bus travel scheme and our support for the bus industry in Scotland. £240 million per annum, with a lifetime cost of around £100 billion and a peak cost of around £4 billion a year. The Scottish Government believes that Trident renewal, which we oppose on moral, economic and strategic grounds, could only be achieved at the expense of conventional defence defence programmes and procurement. So the choice facing Scotland is clear. On the 18th of September, vote for independence and for the withdrawal of Trident from Scotland, or leave that decision to the UK Government and face the possibility of another half century of nuclear weapons sailing from the Gearloch. I move the motion in my name. Thank you very much.
I now call on Willie Rennie to speak to and move Amendment 10724.1. Maximum 10 minutes, Mr Rennie. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, I move the amendment in my name. This debate this afternoon perhaps gives us an indication as to why the nationalist cause, the independence campaign, is struggling. They focus on 5% of the total defence budget and leave ignored the 95% of the budget that remains. That is perhaps why the independence campaign is struggling. It's perhaps why people are concerned that a rather more restricted campaign has been running and we need a more comprehensive answer from the nationalists across a range of issues, which is what I will try and address this afternoon. Um, today could be a big opportunity for the government. After last night's debate, perhaps they're licking their wounds and I would be, <laughs> perhaps they're hunting for a game changer that resurrects their campaign for September. From the public, there's a thirst for answers. The minister and his backbenchers could perhaps provide some of those answers this afternoon, but so far they have been far too limited. But first of what I want to do is to try and tackle some of the assumptions that the nationalists make about this issue. They imply that you are not serious about nuclear disarmament unless you support independence. I will put aside that in this chamber we are all disarmers. Some are multilateral disarmers, some are unilateral disarmers. Because the NPT Treaty requires us all, all members of the NPT Treaty, to work towards nuclear disarmament. So I'll put that to one side. But what we need to consider is the fact that on the Labour benches, there are many people who support unilateral nuclear disarmament. But their commitment to that cause has been questioned by this site. And I think that is unfair and is something they should reconsider. I also believe that this is something that they try and apply to a whole range of issues. Absolutely. So if you look at childcare, you're not fully committed Absolutely. to childcare unless you support independence. Now, I believe firmly in expanding childcare and I've shown my commitment in this chamber. Is my commitment to childcare questioned by those people on those benches? But also the commitment to Scotland. I've got tremendous ambition for Scotland. I want Scotland to do more. I want the best possible platform upon which Scots can achieve that great ambition that we have and that great talent. But I am questioned because I don't believe in an independent Scotland. They also argue that Scotland will automatically result in, so an independent Scotland would automatically result in fewer nuclear weapons in the world, will result in a financial benefit to Scotland and will keep us safer here, including on the Clyde. Some have been convinced by those arguments. But let's look at each one of those arguments in turn. First of all, on cost. Scotland's share of Trident, what, £200 million? We would no longer have to pay that, I admit it. I accept £200 million. It's a small fraction of the total defence budget, but it's not insignificant. It's a reasonable sum. But compare that with the significant economic loss that would result as a result in Jackie Bailey's constituency of the 8,000 jobs that potentially would go, not just now, the potentially 8,000 jobs that we'd lose because the vast bulk of the annual cost of Trident is spent within the Faz Lane area. So that would be lost to Scotland. So 200 million, of course, the Scottish Government would benefit. Gil Patterson says I'm making the issue up. Can it perhaps explain how I'm exactly I'm making that issue up. Gil Patterson. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me. First of all, we're going to replace these jobs with the same amount. It's just that we won't be working on nuclear weapons. So the fact that there's going to be less is actually untrue. Yeah. Yeah. Rennie. So every single penny of investment, the two and a half billion pounds that is currently invested in Trident nuclear weapon systems, the vast bulk that goes to Fasley in the Helensburgh area will be automatically replaced. That is the commitment from the SNP government. So we'll be spending two and a half billion pounds alone within that area. Well, that is a new policy from the SNP, a new policy that has not been costed in the white paper. And it would be very interesting to see the exact numbers. I'll take an intervention from Chick Brody. See if he's Chick Brody. 
Uh, I'm not sure whether Mr Rennie uh, is aware, but in 1983, George Unger, the Secretary of State for Scotland, said that oil had been found in very exploitable co uh, quantities in the Clyde south of Arden. Indeed, a production licence, a production licence. PL262 was given to BP in February 1984. Michael Hesertine confirmed two months ago that the MOD of which he Your was Secretary is, of State Mr. Had, blocked, had blocked all oil uh, uh, efforts in the Clyde. What is Mr Rennie's support when he talks about costs, when we've lost the amount of revenue that we had Mr. Rennie, and the jobs you, that's of enough, young Mr. people Brody. lost to Scotland? Mr Brodie, sit down. Thank you. If, he, if Chick Brodie wants to rejoin the Liberal Democrats and sit on these benches <laughs> um, and make a contribution, and perhaps he could lead for the Liberal Democrats on this subject uh, in future. Um, I'm sure his constituents would be interested in that uh, proposition. So, on the one hand, on the one hand we've had a, an extra commitment, a financial commitment from Gil Patterson of £2.5 billion investment on the Clyde. Tremendous commitment. I would like to see the costing for that. But on the one... No, on the... Uh, Gil Patterson, point of order. Can I ask you... Uh, uh, Deputy Pre Presiding Officer, not to allow uh, Mr Rennie to put words into my mouth. We were talking about talking about employment, not money spent in Helensborough. Uh, thank you. Uh, that's not a point of order, as I suspect a member of your experience is well aware, Mr Patterson, but you have made your point, Mr Rennie. I don't think I needed to write a speech, in fact. I think my colleagues on these other benches would have helped uh, with it. The second point because we have to weigh up the £200 million the Scottish Government would benefit from to the 8,000 jobs that we would lose on the Clyde. Secondly, is on world peace. The argument is that the United Kingdom would have nowhere to put its nuclear weapon system, that somehow they would be forced to abandon the nuclear weapon system because Scotland would force them to leave these shores. If they think that the United Kingdom, along its very long shore, right around England and Wales, there is no place at all whatsoever to base those nuclear weapons, then that is naive. So the result is, the result is that we would have no fewer nuclear weapons in the world as a result. And I'm sure they're, they're holding up the CND uh, report that apparently claims there is nowhere along the very long coastline of the United Kingdom to which the visa I think they maybe have an agenda. I think they maybe think that actually perhaps that they are in favour of, order, of being at any price and at any cost. But the reality is there, is, there would be a place for the nuclear weapon system in the rest of the United Kingdom. So it would not advance world peace. And thirdly is safety on the Clyde. It's implied that somehow Glasgow, Greenock and Paisley is under greater threat because the nuclear weapon system is in Helensborough in Faz Lane. Now, I suspect that if a nuclear bomb went off in Plymouth, that Glasgow somehow might be affected at some point. I think there maybe would be casualties in Scotland. The reality is it's never happened, there's never been an accident, but they try to exaggerate the consequences. But the reality is Glasgow, the west of Scotland, would not be any safer if we moved the nuclear weapons south of the border. So some people have been convinced that if you, if you believe, not just now, if you believe in an independent Scotland, therefore you will result, you will secure, no, not just now, you will secure um, a nuclear-free world. That is naive, and those who are voting for independence on that basis, I think, have been misled. I would far rather maintain my influence over the weapons system to advance multilateral disarmament across the globe than abdicate our responsibility and refuse to take part in any discussions, refuse to contribute to the debate by creating an independent Scotland. That, to me, is far from looking to the global interest. That is far from looking to world peace. That is far from trying to advance the peace of the world. It's what it is, is turning in on ourselves, only considering what we regard as pure for ourselves and not what is interest in the interest of the wider world. you draw to a close? That, I say to those who are considering supporting independence on that basis is something that they should reconsider. They should not listen to these people on these benches. They are selling them a pig in a poke, and it's not going to work. Thank you. Thanks very much. And I now call on Patrick Harvey to speak to and move Amendment 10724.
Point two, Mr Harvey, you have six minutes. Thank you, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to contribute uh, to this debate, uh, restating, as we should, uh, a reminder that consistently a majority of Scotland's people, Scotland's representatives at Westminster and here in this Scottish Parliament have opposed current UK policy on the nuclear weapons which are based here. Yesterday, the cross-party group on nuclear disarmament heard from Bruce Kent of CND and Ward Wilson from the Rethinking Nuclear Weapons Project. Bruce Kent's voice uh, in this debate is a familiar and much respected one. He reminded us of the history of the anti-nuclear movement in the UK, and he shared whether something of the hope felt by activists north and south of the border that Scotland can lead the way by voting yes to independence and then giving an unequivocal no to nuclear weapons. Many uh, members will have heard Bruce Kent outline the moral arguments before against weapons of mass destruction. Principle among them, of course, is the inability of nuclear weapons to discriminate between civilian and military targets. They are only capable of the mass slaughter of innocent people. As the world has reacted with horror in the last few weeks over the civilian deaths meted out in Gaza, the indiscriminate action, not discriminating between civilian and military targets, it should be crystal clear that any country using nuclear weapons in any context would be a pariah state for generations to come. But additionally, additionally, there is a moral dimension to what nuclear weapons symbolise, their cultural meaning. As my favourite fictional Prime Minister Harry Perkins put it when announcing the dismantling of Britain's nuclear weapons, with this action, we shall also be dismantling the idea that our freedom somehow depends on the fear of annihilation. It is an absurd and obscene idea. We want no part of it. And I hope that we can re uh, capture the ambition to turn that fiction into reality. Ward Wilson, on the other hand, used yesterday's meeting to outline these strategic arguments. His case is the ideology of nuclear weapons is based on myths, myths which need to be exposed. And I think it's a a compelling case. The myth that nuclear weapons won the Second World War. We can and should mourn the lives lost in such vast numbers in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, but there remains, even after all this time, no definitive reason to believe that either nuclear attack was the key event which led to the Japanese surrender. The entry of the Soviet Union into the war precipitated the immediate political response by Japan's Supreme Council. And the Japanese historian Tsuyoshi Hasegawa, I beg your pardon, has stated that the Soviet entry into the war played a much greater role than the atomic bombs in inducing Japan to surrender because it dashed any hope that Japan could terminate the war through Moscow's mediation. The second myth, that they represent a leap in decisiveness. Now, even at the time uh, of their development, this was a dubious claim. The bombs uh, dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki certainly killed on a mass scale, but so too did the firebombing that had preceded it. The firebombing of Tokyo alone killed well over 100,000 people, on a par with the bombing of Hiroshima. But seen from today's perspective, this argument is even less credible. Nuclear weapons are the messiest, the clumsiest uh, of, of weapons available, not only incapable of discriminating between civilian and military targets, incapable of reliable geographical targeting. To use them against a neighbour would be suicidal. Even to use them against a distant state would have incalculable impact on others nearby. At a time when military innovation is focused on precise, targeted and so-called surgical weapons, Trident and its like begin to look like an absurd relic, as convincing a piece of technology as the blunderbuss. Thirdly, the myth that deterrence is safe and reliable. Nuclear weapons have shown themselves unable to deter states from taking illegal and unacceptable conventional action against their neighbours, as the situation in Ukraine demonstrates, despite that country's membership of NATO's Partnership for Peace. But beyond that, we should acknowledge the long history of near-miss incidents in which threats, accidents and even weather phenomena have been misinterpreted and could so easily have led to nuclear exchanges with catastrophic consequences. Nuclear deterrence is inherently unsafe, unstable and precarious. 
the myth that nuclear weapons have kept the peace for 60 years. Can anyone seriously look at the history of the last 60 years and, and say, as we were told at the time, that there is a, a clear dividing line between the pre-nuclear and the post-nuclear age? As we look around the world and see the proliferation of conventional weapons, the record of the UK in wars, whether for reasons we call justified or not, uh, and the continued power of the armed industry. This technology has not kept the peace. And finally, that the nuclear genie cannot be put it back into the bottle. The argument that it cannot be uninvented may be true, but that does not confer utility on a technology uh, which has no useful purpose. There is a clear possibility and a growing momentum for a global ban on nuclear weapons, as shown at the conference, attended by over 140 governments in Mexico earlier this year. A written close, constitution please. can achieve this in Scotland. But not only that, it can challenge the nonsense that a journey from unilateral disarmament to multilateral disarmament is in any way compatible with the UK's policy of unilateral rearmament. I can only imagine the Commonwealth standard mental gymnastics required to make that link. A yes vote is not simply about moving them from one place to another. It's about tipping the balance Thanks. in the rest of the UK as well and winning the case against renewal Thanks of this much. vicious system. I move the amendment in Can my name. On Ian Gray. Six minutes. We're very tight for time today. Mr Gray. Thank you, Deputy President. Officer, deterrence and disarmament is a profound and complex issue encompassing geopolitical calculation and moral argument too. And beyond an absolutist position of pacifism, drawing distinctions between weapons and different modes of war is always difficult and often ambiguous. And Patrick Harvey touched on this. We should note and remember that it was 69 years ago today that over 50,000 died at Hiroshima as a result of a single bomb blast. Yet we also remember this week World War I, in which on a single day, in a single battle, over 50,000 men died on one side alone, victims of the most conventional of weapons. And I know that I've never been a member of CND, but I did campaign against landmines, which killed just as indiscriminately, although one person at a time. These issues are never black and white, and none of this is made any simpler by the unpredictable nature of conflict. The Cold War has ended, but tension in Europe has not. Conflicts in the Middle East seem never ending, but always changing, and drones and cyber warfare pose completely new questions of defence, security and deterrence. A pity, then, that we once again find ourselves debating an issue like this as a tactic in the Scottish Government's pursuit of independence. It's a tactic they return to, and Mr Brown did this today, because they think they've been terribly clever to spot that people in the Labour Party have different views on Trident. Well, here's a surprise. It's been like that since the 50s, when Britain first had a nuclear weapon. It's been like that since Nye Bevan made his famous naked into the conference chamber speech in the year I was born. We are a democratic party. We tolerate debate and argument and different views. I know that's hard for the SNP to understand, <laughs> but there it is. And it has moved us quickly. Peter Brown. On the issue, on the issue of tolerating different points of view, remember, remember during the last debate where Michael McMahon described CND as a campaign for nuclear delusion. Was that tolerant? Well, that's Mr McMahon's view, and many of his colleagues would take a different view. That's the point I make. And it's a, a difference in a debate which has taken us in the right direction over time. Since the end of the Cold War, the UK's nuclear capacity has reduced by 75 per cent. The last Labour government alone reduced available warheads from 300 to 160 and got rid of air, aircraft-borne nuclear weapons altogether. And we have not committed to the replacement of Trident either. So I personally believe that multilateralism can work. But I acknowledge the views of many of my colleagues. I know there is a perfectly respectable moral case for unilateralism. What there is not a moral or even logical case for is moving nuclear weapons a few hundred miles south and calling that disarmament. That's not disarmament, it's redeployment. That's not dismantling, as, I'm sorry, that's not dismantling as Harry Perkins in the, the novel uh, did, it's dissembling. And worse still is the government's position that Trident should be moved to England 
and then Scotland should join NATO, thus positioning ourselves four square behind NATO's nuclear deterrent, which would, of course, include the very trident we had just expelled. As far as I am concerned, it is hypocritical to say we shouldn't have nuclear weapons and we want to belong to NATO. How dare we say that? That's not my words, that's Sandra White MSP's words, and she is right. No wonder the SNP are split on this policy, on the policy of NATO. No wonder the SNP are split. Kenny McCaskill is no Nye Bevan, but he it was who had to be sent into the SNP conference to plead with them not to send the SNP into the referendum campaign naked on defence. But that NATO position is hypocritical and dishonest. It's dishonest too on Trident savings, where we have a different story every day. It will pay for a conventional defence force. No, it will pay for childcare. No, it will pay for youth unemployment and colleges. And that's just what Alex Salmond has told us in recent months. I have a list of his colleagues spending the same money on pensions and schools and welfare and teachers and a dozen other things. Mr Brown is laughing. He's going to spend it on export opportunities. So, you know, that's, that's what you said. Sorry, Mr Brown, but that's what you said. Your colleague, Angus Robertson, is going to spend it on more diplomatic missions. So, they may not be able to tell us what currency we will have, but at least we know, at least we know that it must be a magic currency which can be spent over and over and over and over again on different things. The truth is the running costs of Trident are about £160 million per annum in Scottish share, and that would barely pay for this government's plans to cut air passenger duty. As you draw it would course. only pay for a fraction of the corporation tax windfall they've promised our big companies. It would not replace the £230 million Faslane injects into the local economy or replace the 11,000 jobs their policy places under threat there. Disarmament. It is one of the great moral and political questions of the last three generations. Must close, to reduce please. it to a referendum tactic, as the motion does, is simply wrong, and we will vote against it. Thank you so much. And I now call on Annabel Goldie. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. This is the uh, third time in less than 18 months that I've spoken in this Parliament on Trident. Now, of course, it is important. But given what is happening to our country in six weeks' time, should we not be debating other things um, if Scotland becomes independent, like the risk and uncertainty over currency, EU membership, pensions, NHS and jobs? Because judging from the pasting the First Minister took last night, these would seem more pressing issues. And indeed, not everyone seems to agree with the Scottish Government on this issue, because according to a poll, 41% of people agree if Scotland becomes independent, Britain's nuclear weapons submarines should continue to be based here. And 37% wanted to see them uh, go elsewhere. So they don't even have a unanimity of position within Scotland. Yeah, yeah. Now, as I've said before, Deputy Presiding Officer, nuclear weapons do have an awesome capacity for destruction. And they are expensive. But for the moment, they are necessary. The SNP's position that if we banish Trident from Scotland's shores, our country will be safer and our conscience will be clear, I believe is both misconceived, no thanks, and completely flawed. Because firstly, to achieve a safer world, as other contributors have said, we must use the forum of international influence and debate. We need to promote and deploy the existing non-proliferation treaty and focus the attention of the major world powers on multilateral de-escalation and disarmament. And secondly, how credible is the argument that by simply plucking Trident from Fast Lane and moving it down the coast without caring where it ends up, the world somehow becomes a safer place? That is a facile proposition. And I profoundly disagree with those who argue that removing Trident from Scotland will somehow make Scotland a safer place. No thanks. We remain safer by retaining Trident at Fast Lane. And thirdly, 
And thirdly, the fundamental principles that are relevant to nuclear deterrence have not changed since the end of the Cold War and are sadly unlikely to change in the immediate future. Deterrence is the key word. <clears throat> and it is precisely because of their destructive powers that nuclear weaponry has the capability to deter acts of aggression. That scale of deterrence is completely different to any other form. Indeed, last month, the Trident Commission, an independent cross-party commission, said it is in the UK's national interest to keep the Trident nuclear weapons system. We simply cannot dismiss the possibility that a major direct nuclear threat to the UK might re-emerge. The fact is that since acquiring Trident and its predecessor Polaris, we have had four decades of non-nuclear conflict. At present, at present, at present, as part of the UK, we have a strong defence capability. An independent Scotland's defence capability would be much more limited, giving it much less clout and much less influence on the international stage. What we all want to achieve, and I genuinely believe this is what we all want to achieve in this chamber, multilateral uh, disarmament, cannot be negotiated from a position of weakness. It doesn't work that way. In fact, in fact, unilateral disarmament will only weaken the momentum for multilateral yeah, yeah. disarmament. Yeah. And the other aspect of this debate is the consequence of independence for thousands of jobs in Scotland, many of them in the area of the west of Scotland, which I represent. Because these are not only jobs in the armed services, but also in the many defence companies which rely heavily on contracts from the Ministry of Defence. And the defence sector is a hugely important part of Scotland's industry. It employs over 12,600 people in highly skilled, high-value jobs in areas such as design, manufacture, assembly and maintenance. At present, Fastlane sustains around 6,700 military and civilian jobs, and this is projected to increase to 8,200 by 2022. But for the communities of Helensburg and Western Bartonshire and their local economies, precipitate removal of Trident from Fastlane would have a disastrous effect. Fastlane contributes £250 million to the local economy, and the base indirectly supports over 7,000 jobs in the area. And if anyone wants to know how passionately that area feels, go to a public meeting on this issue, and there will not be much support for the Scottish Government's motion yeah, yeah. before us today. We all aspire to a world that is free of nuclear weapons, and the only way to achieve that is to work proactively and vigorously and on the international stage to expand and enhance the Non-Proliferation Treaty. The UK has an excellent track record in that respect. Unilateralism would be an absolute gift to any rogue nation or hostile power that was developing illegal nuclear Members capacity. In the last minute. And let us not hide our heads in the sand. These rogue nations and hostile powers do exist. At present, because of the existence of nuclear arsenals around the world, the possibility of further proliferation of weapons by rogue stakes, and the continuing risk of worldwide instability and tension, the UK's nuclear deterrent remains an important element of our national security. Now, that being said, and in line with the Non-Proliferation Treaty, we are taking steps to reduce our nuclear arsenal. The government is reducing the UK stockpile of nuclear weapons to no more than 180 warheads and a maximum of 40 per vessel. And that will be complete by the mid-2020s. As part of the UK, we are able to defend both our own nation, our citizens, and influence international debate. We all want a nuclear-free world, but the unilateral removal of Trident is certainly not the way to achieve it. Thank you very much. And we now move to open debate. But before we do, and before I call Mr Kidd to be followed by Michael McMahon, I just remind members that interventions made from a sedentary position are no more welcome than they have ever been. Mr Kidd, five minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, can I declare um, that I am a co-president of Parliamentarians for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament and the Scottish representative on the Global Council of Abolition 2000. Presiding officer, there are members from across this chamber who favour nuclear disarmament, as indeed there are at Westminster, lest it be forgotten. And amongst others that I have worked with are my good friends Jeremy Corbyn, MP of Labour, and Baroness Sue Miller um, of the Liberal Democrats. And I've worked with them and spoken with them at many international conferences overseas on achieving our joint aim of a world without nuclear weapons. So with this in mind, I believe that today should be seen by us all as an opportunity to think 
about how Scotland, as the sole repository of the entire UK nuclear weapons arsenal, should look towards the removal of Trident and in what timescale that should be aimed at. Because, as a signatory of the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, the UK has signed up to a duty to work towards the end of these weapons of mass destruction. And it's our duty here, whether as unilateralists or multilateralists, to work in honest good faith to achieve that end, not just to talk about it. That must mean, that must mean not upgrading or replacing Trident at a cost of up to £100 billion, with the intention, and it is the intention of the British Government to do so, to maintain this system for the next 40 to 50 years. That is not in good faith with the NPT. Indeed, it's our duty here to work towards nuclear disarmament as soon as, as, and quickly as possible. And the reason behind that is because we are here representing not only the people of Scotland, but people around the world who believe that nuclear weapons are a danger to us all. But why not continue with the established nuclear weapons such as Trident? I mean, there's one or two voices in the wilderness crying out saying nuclear weapons are actually a good thing. They've stopped us from having wars. I haven't noticed us stopping from having wars. I think there's plenty of wars ongoing. They might not be nuclear wars, but they are wars. In other words, Trident hasn't stopped a single war. It just hasn't been a nuclear war. Well, nuclear weapons are not a force of nature. And they're not a magic genie from a bottle, as was mentioned earlier by Patrick Harvey. They're an invention of man. They do not keep us safe in perpetuity because, like all man-made equipment, they're capable of failure. Like Carol Wallenda, the greatest type rock walker ever, you can walk the rope suspended in the air day and daily for over 60 years. But one day, as unfortunately happened to Mr Wallenda, even with great skill and great knowledge, your luck can run out and devastating tragedy will be the outcome. It might also be asked, what good are nuclear weapons against cybercrime or in the war against illegal drugs or in the battle against the criminal madness of ISIS as they rampage across the Middle East or the terror threats on our own shores? What good are nuclear weapons there? Long-term security without nuclear deterrence involves investment in international cross-border cooperation and conventional armed forces. To that point, from major military figures such as General Sir Hugh Beach, uh, former Master of the General Ordnance of the British Forces, and General Ramsbottom, former Commander of the UK Field Army in the UK, and General Bernard Norlan, former Chief of the French Air Force, to my friends and colleagues who have actually worked at the sharp end of missile delivery in the Royal Navy, retired Lieutenant Commanders Fergal Dalton and Robert Green, all of these are officers who have had to oversee nuclear weapons in the real world and all of whom believe that Trident has no utility to the military and all of whom would rather have fully trained and equipped forces to defend their people rather than a genie with a magic wand which is supposed to cause fear in the ranks of enemies and keep us safe forever. Yesterday in Committee Room 3, I held a meeting with guest speakers, the international lecturer and author Ward Wilson, who's in the gallery, and Bruce Kent of CND UK. Bruce, who actually says he supports Scottish independence as a faster route to getting rid of Trident. That was a great meeting. It said a great deal. And on top of it, I just received an email from the former mayor of Hiroshima, Tadatoshi Akiba, who says he's looking forward to a successful debate today in the Scottish Parliament, paving the way to an independent Scotland joining the 2020 vision of a world free of nuclear weapons. Thank you very much. I now call on Michael McMahon to be followed by Christina McKelvey. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy President Officer. The principles that apply to war of any kind are that we have an obligation to avoid war if at all possible, and the use of force must be a last resort. As Patrick Harvey quite rightly said, the use of force must be discriminate. Civilians, civilian facilities may not be the object of direct intentional attack, and care must be taken to avoid and minimise the indirect harm to civilians. The use of force must be proportionate. The overall destruction must not outweigh the good to be achieved, and there must be the probability of success. 
Now, having considered these principles, I cannot arrive at any other conclusion than that the fighting of a nuclear war must be rejected because it cannot ensure non-combatant immunity and the likely destruction and enduring radiation would violate the principle of proportionality. The real risks inherent in nuclear war make the probability of success impossible. In a nuclear war, there are no victors, there are only victims. The argument for the possession of nuclear weapons as a deterrent is for me not an adequate strategy as a long-term basis for peace. It is a transitional strategy justifiable only in conjunction with the resolute determination to pursue arms control and disarmament. You cannot make the world safer through the threat of nuclear weapons, and you can only make the world safer from nuclear weapons through mutual nuclear disarmament. This will be, require both bilateral, multilateral and, if possible, unilateral decisions, but all done in cooperation. And this is where the SNP's position unravels beyond credulity. Patrick Harvey. I'm grateful to Mr McMahon for giving way. Would he acknowledge, simply as a matter of fact, that during this era of nuclear deterrence as a strategic concept, the world has seen an increase in the number of nuclear states, not a decrease. That's absolutely factually correct. Michael There's no McMahon. dispute in that. But the end does not justify the means. But the end can and should inform the means. Abolishing nuclear weapons is not a partisan or nationalistic issue. It's an issue of fundamental moral values, and it should unite people across national and ideological boundaries. However, in order to achieve nuclear disarmament, we must carefully assess every nuclear policy proposal in light of its potential to help bring us closer to a world without nuclear weapons. What we cannot do in an international debate around nuclear disarmament is use a constitutional debate which would do nothing more than move an existing nuclear facility from one side of a border to another if we are serious about pursuing genuine nuclear disarmament throughout the world. It is essential to translate the goal of a world without nuclear weapons from an idealistic dream or pious hope to a genuine policy objective to be achieved carefully and in the context of international dialogue. There are valid questions about what new risks might arise as the world moves towards zero nuclear arms. And these questions deserve concrete solutions, solutions that can only be crafted by the committed international policymakers and experts. Most world leaders, religious figures and other people of goodwill who support a nuclear weapons free world are not naive about the task that lies ahead. They know the path will be difficult and will require determined political leadership, strong public support and the dedicated skills of many leaders and technical experts. The non-nuclear aspirations of the SNP and others are very welcome, but the contradictions between a NATO membership and the independent state action are incongruous to that aspiration. The SNP argues that an independent Scotland would have an independent defence and foreign policy which would defend Scotland's national interests. Yet the reality is that as a member of NATO, it would be impossible for a Scottish Government alone to get rid of Trident. The SNP also speak about the speediest safe removal of nuclear weapons, and they argue that we could see the dismantling of nuclear weapons within two years and removal within the first term of a post-independence government. But the obstacles to that would be huge, not least from the NATO alliance itself. So whether you approve of Trident or not, it cannot be ignored that it is an assigned uh, weapon to NATO. Yet the SNP want us to believe that a Scottish Government would be asking to join a military alliance while at the same time wanting to undermine the core part of that alliance's strategic strike force. As you draw to a close, please. Replicating the existing facilities of Faslane and Coolport elsewhere in Britain, and I believe, as Willie Rennie said, a new site would be found, would take at least a decade. So I don't doubt the sincerity of those in the SNP who wish to see China move for our close, shores. Please, Mr. I McMahon. support that ambition. I just cannot support their policy or this motion. Many thanks. I now call on Christina McKelvey to be followed by Neil Findlay. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you very much, President Officer. Trident, the elephant in our backyard. Weapons of mass destruction that will cost us £4 billion a year in the, by the mid-2020s. Do we want them there? 
Do we want secret nighttime convoys of warheads driving along the M8 or through my constituency via the M74 or through the largest population centres in Scotland? No, I don't think we do. But just in case anyone is unsure, moving these weapons and radioactive materials around uh, by road is far from safe, whatever propaganda Annabel Goldie would like to tell us today. A Freedom of Information request to the MOD revealed that there had been 70 safety lapses across the UK in five and a half years. Vehicles have got lost, a fuse box failed, fuel has leaked, brakes have overheated, alarms have malfunctioned and the gun flap of a vehicle opened inadvertently. Do not delude yourself. These are not safe. And if there was to be some kind of accident and the MOD concedes that this is possible, our Westminster Defence Chiefs would refer to it as an inadvertent yield. That language tells me something about how the MOD views a potential accidental Hiroshima. I suppose the entire population of Greater Glasgow would not only be an inadvertent yield, but just collateral damage. This isn't about the cost either. Just as important as the moral price, no, the price of immorality, because the very pres presence of Trident is an affront to any concept of morality. David Cameron doesn't want Trident anywhere near his voters. Neither do I. Neither do I. But he knows very well that he's got a choice to make, and that choice will cost him voters. But after the, I guess, vote on 18 September, Mr Cameron will have his own reality to face. But Scots have already paid too big a price to have these abhorrent we weapons in our backyard. According to the Westminster Scottish Affairs Committee in over October 2012, and I quote, nuclear weapons in Scotland could be disarmed within days and removed within months. CND thinks it would take a couple of years to fully decommission the weapons. We plan, as a government, to have them out of here by the first post-independence parliament. We in Scotland, and not only yes voters, have made it very clear we don't want Trident. In fact, 80% of Scots have said don't replace it. In this chamber, members have repeatedly and conclusively voiced their opposition. On Monday, Bruce Kent, Vice President of CND, gave his backing to the yes vote because he points out a yes vote would lead to the removal of a moral and illegal Trident from Faslane and Scotland and most likely the rest of the UK. He added that it is quite clear that the Westminster parties have no intention of getting rid of Trident. When I first heard Bruce Kent speak, I was 15 years old and he inspired me to join CND. My young son, who's 16 years old, is sitting in the gallery listening to this debate. I don't want his son at 16 sitting in the dark gallery listening to the same debate years from now. And he spoke yesterday that he's lost nothing and he's lost nothing of his conviction. Absolutely nothing. Trident must go. How can anybody justify the power to wipe out half the world? The real threats to world peace come from the extremist terrorists, the 9-11 attacks, the irreconcilable divide between Israel and Palestine, the many tragic civilian deaths we have seen in Gaza, the Sunni Shiite split in Syria, or the ongoing internal battles in Afghanistan. Is anyone seriously suggesting that nuclear weapons will act as a deterrent to the Taliban? And I'm not pretending that aggression isn't a risk against which we must equip ourselves as far as practicable. What I am saying categorically is nuclear weapons is not the way to do that. The reason that most countries in the world are trying to stop nuclear proliferation is very simple. They recognise that the more weapons of mass destruction are available, the more they will proliferate. Countries that have not considered acquiring the capacity start to feel under pressure. They think we have to do this because everyone else is. And you know what? Harley Burton will do them a great deal. And that's not a good base in which to build a defence policy. We have spent too long in enforced silence. It is time for the people of Scotland, the voices of our own electorate, to say no to Trident, no to Westminster, and yes to an independent Scotland, where we can have the freedom to make our own decisions according to our own choices and priorities, instead of wasting billions of pounds on Trident. Let's make a positive choice for ourselves. Employ another 3,300 nurses or 2,700 teachers. That's investing in the future. Trident is an investment in global murder. Thanks so much. I now call on Neil Finlay to be followed by Kevin Stewart. Up to five minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. And President Officer, I for, uh, have forgotten to declare my membership in CND and my register of interest, so I put it on the record now. And it may be helpful in the interest of transparency that others do so as well during the debate, if indeed they have such interests. And can I also <coughs> excuse me, apologise to Bill Kidd for being unable to make that meeting yesterday? I did intend going, but for other reasons. I have been an opponent of uh, nuclear weapons all my adult life, and my position is reflected by many people across the Labour Party and the wider Labour 
and trade union movements. So the fact that there are different views and opinions on nuclear weapons and trident renewal is hardly a revelation or a secret. Indeed, as Ian Gray pointed out, there have been differences within the Labour movement since the issue, the nuclear uh, issue raised its head. And this range of opinion is reflected, further reflected, across the wider political spectrum and society. We see people like the former Labour Chief Whip, Nick Brown, Lib Dem MP Nick Harvey and former Tory MP and Minister Michael, Michael Portillo. We see churches, trade unions and civic organisations all coming out against Trident renewal. To me, that type of broad coalition building is important. It's what organisations like CND should be doing, building the broadest coalition in support of their aims to convince people through argument and debate, people from all backgrounds, that the case against Trident is a strong one and a just one. It was therefore, in my view, a great mistake for Scottish CND to break with the consensus building by taking a position on the referendum, something I think they may regret on reflection in the longer term, certainly. I thank Mr Finlay for taking an intervention, and I noted that he said he was a member of the CND. I remember very well that vote at Scottish CND. Mr Finlay was not there. Can I ask why? Can you ask why? Neil Finlay? Because I wasn't there for, for a variety of reasons. But I know of people who were there and were very disappointed that CND took that position. Unfortunately, you can't be at everything, and, and the member will know that. <coughs> but I say on, again on reflection, I think they will regret that. Let me be unequivocal. I personally oppose nuclear weapons and the renewal, no thank you, and the renewal of Trident for ethical, financial and practical reasons. These weapons designed using some of the most fantastic and sophisticated engineering skills and ingenuity available have only one purpose, and that is the destruction of human life on an unprecedented scale. Each of the current missiles has a range of up to 7,500 miles and is extremely accurate with the destructive power of eight Hiroshima's. But then, officer, if that is the level of destruction of just one bomb, then all our nuclear war, an all-out nuclear war or a unilateral attack using modern weaponry would see death and destruction on a scale never seen before. And I cannot, in all conscience, support such a system whose only purpose is to kill my fellow human beings on such a large scale. However, presiding officer, having said that, I find the terms of today's motion cynical and opportunist. There is no attempt to, uh, uh, in the motion to build a broad parliamentary coalition against Trident replacement. No attempt to reach out and build the moral or practical case, just a cynical partisan attempt to use Trident as a referendum issue. And if it is the case that a vote for separation, somewhat less likely, I think, given the First Minister's performance last night, however, if it is the case that a vote for separation uh, brings us closer to Trident removal, then why did the SNP, after years of opposition, just at the time they think they're about to achieve their political raison d'etre, decide to join NATO, a first-strike nuclear alliance. Is that not an odd position to take? And of course, President Officer, even if the nuclear fleet sailed out of the Clyde to be moored in Barrow or the Tyne or the Mersey, would it make the world a safer place? Would it mean fewer nuclear weapons in the world? No, of course it wouldn't. It would simply displace them elsewhere. We even tried in a few hundred miles south it wouldn't make me sleep any easier in my bed at night. It wouldn't solve my conscience one bit. It's not an out of sight, out of mind issue for me when it comes to Trident. So in my view, we have a far better chance of getting rid of Trident if we can convince UK public opinion, the military and politicians at all levels that Trident renewal is wrong and that the UK and the world will be a safer place without it. Then we should negotiate it draw to away because we will have much more negotiating power. Finally, President Officer, let me finish with a quote from the late great Tony Benn, a man who opposed independence Briefly, but was a please. lifelong peace campaigner. He said, if we can find money to kill people, we can find money to help people. As always, he found a few simple, uh, profound words to explain a complex issue. Thanks very much. Now call on Kevin Stewart to be followed by Malcolm Chisholm. Up to five minutes, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. And I think today uh, we should show some leadership 
and try and persuade others in the world uh, to follow our lead uh, to eradicate uh, nuclear weapons, not only um, from Scotland, but from the entire planet. And there have been many arguments here today, but I think some of the interesting things that have been said by former pro-nuclear supporters about Trident replacement have to be brought to the fore here today. Michael Pertillo, the former UK Defence Secretary, uh, said on BBC This Week on the 2nd of November 2012, Trident is completely past its sell-by date, a waste of money and is no deterrent to the Taliban. Des Brown, former Labour UK Defence Secretary in The Telegraph on the 5th of, 5th of February 2013 said, updating Trident with a like-for-like -like replacement will demonstrate to the international community that we intend to keep nuclear weapons on permanent deployment for decades while seeking to deny those weapons to everyone else. In the process, it will destroy any chance of building the broad-based international support required for a stronger non-proliferation and nuclear security regime. I agree with both of these gentlemen. And when I say um, take the lead, I think in terms of uh, treaties and uh, nearing the eradication of certain other weapon systems, it has always required leadership from some. It took leadership um, from, from some nations to get to the Biological Weapons Convention. It took leadership from others uh, to get to the point of the Chemical Weapons Convention. And Mr Gray mentioned landmines. It took leadership from some to get to the Ottawa Treaty to ensure that these... Yeah. Ian Gray? Is that not an illustration of exactly what I was saying? The Landmine Treaty was a treaty multilaterally agreed where a significant number, dozens of nations, together agreed to give up that weapon. That was multilateralism. I'll, I'll answer that. No, it yeah, wasn't. Sure. In, in most regards, it was unilateralism. No, it because was. at the end of the day, individual countries reached a point where they could come together. And unfortunately, and unfortunately, some countries did not, have still not signed up to that. Individuals got rid of their landmines before the signing of that treaty. That is unilateralism, and that is the way we should go. In terms of uh, Mr Finlay and certain others, I don't want to see nuclear weapons moved from Faz Lane to other parts uh, of these islands. And I really don't think that will happen. And I think that folk need to have a look at some of the evidence. And some of that evidence has been gathered up in, in John Ainsley's uh, publication, No Place for Trident, which I think makes very interesting reading and bringing a lot of these points together. Um, on page 12 uh, of, that, uh, of that work, uh, Mr uh, Ainsley says, in January 2012, the Telegraph quoted an MOD source as saying, births would not be a problem. There are docks on the south coast that could be used without too much fuss, but there simply isn't anywhere else where we can do what we can do at Coolport, and without that, there is no deterrent. Beyond that, a former commander of Faz Lane poured cold water in any plans to re relocate. Rear Admiral Alabaster said, it would be very difficult, in fact I would almost use the word inconceivable, to recreate the facilities necessary to mount the strategic deterrent without the use of Faz Lane and Coalport somewhere else uh, in the UK. That is one of the reasons why I think if we vote for independence and say no to nuclear weapons here, uh, that they will be eradicated completely and utterly from these islands. And hopefully, after that, others will see that we have taken the lead and will do likewise elsewhere. Finally, um, uh, Presiding Officer, £100 billion pounds spent on Trident at a time of austerity, in my book, is plain wrong. In fact, is evil. And I have said in this chamber before that I would put teachers before Trident, nurses before nukes, and bairns before bombs. And I hope everyone will agree behind uh, to support that motion today. Very nice. I now call on Malcolm Chisholm to be followed by John McAlpin. Uh, Presiding officer, as Ian Gray said, uh, there have been different views in the Labour Party about uh, nuclear weapons since the 1950s, and I fully respect 
uh, the views uh, of colleagues who take a different position from me, but I myself have supported uh, campaigns against Trident for the last uh, three and a half decades since uh, Trident was announced uh, by, in the early years of the Conservative government of the time. But what I have never supported is Trident nimbyism and the futile distraction of moving Trident somewhere else. Uh, that would not help the cause of international disarmament one little bit, any more than, for example, the movement of missiles from Belarus and Kazakhstan to Russia after the Cold War had any disarmament consequences whatsoever. I would argue that Trident nimbyism would actually make the situation worth it would strengthen the resolve of those in the rest of the United Kingdom who want to renew Trident. It would strengthen their resolve, if you think about it psychologically as well as strategically, and it would weaken the uh, multilateral possibilities that still exist at a UK level. And we've heard many examples of this, how thinking is changing, even within the military establishment, even within the political establishment. I think uh, um, the last speaker referred to Desbound, a former defence secretary. I could mention Michael Portillo, a former conservative defence secretary, who's now against Trident. So things are different from what they were 35 years ago. There are multilateral possibilities, but this Trident mimbyism would weaken those possibilities I give way. Um, I, I thank Mr yeah, Chisholm for giving way. If he supports uh, the like of Des Brown, can he tell us categorically here and now uh, what the Labour Party position is going to be in the run-up uh, to the next election? Because his uh, defence spokesperson at Westminster, uh, Mr Coker, seems to be very much in favour of Trident replacement, as are the Tories, as are the Liberals. Well, I Mr. began Chisholm. my speech by saying there are different views, and that final decision will be taken uh, in 2016. But there's another consideration, and I, uh, obviously, in general terms, uh, I'm opposed to Trident. But if the, uh, the uh, SNP, in the event of a yes vote, uh, uh, sticks uh, uh, with this policy in an inflexible way, they have to face the reality that there will be a heavy price to pay in the negotiations after independence, when already we know the fiscal situation is going to be more difficult in an independent Scotland than in the rest of the UK, and the fiscal challenges would become even greater, because think of the billions it would cost to remove Trident, and we already know from the UK government that that would be an important consideration in those negotiations. And that's why, of course, there are some strong voices in the peace movement who actually don't believe that the SNP would stick with its policy. For example, Tim Duffy, one of the great peace campaigners in Scotland of the last uh, few de decades, in the Justice and Peace Scotland uh, editorial uh, of, I think, the most recent edition, said uh, there were several problems, several problems with the logic of voting yes to get rid of Trident. And one of the examples he gave was that the real politics situation would be very tempting for the, uh, uh, for the government, the Scottish uh, government, to accept some deal with the UK government. And of course, it's very interesting here. The First Minister last night was very keen to mention again and again this mysterious unnamed UK minister who was going to, uh, was going to said there would be a shared currency. Of course, single currency. What he didn't say was that minister said, yeah, there'll be a single currency because we'll do a deal on Trident. I'm not saying that'll happen, but that's the kind, that's the kind of thinking that would be involved because actually Trident is the single most important bargaining counter that the Scottish Government has. And of course, there's another problem, another doubt as well, because it may well be that the Scottish Government would have to choose between NATO, joining NATO, uh, or getting uh, rid uh, of Trident. And of course, they say, they say, and perhaps Gene Urquhart's going to say, I haven't got time to say the intervention, that there are lots Evan, of countries without nuclear weapons in NATO. But there is no precedent for a country that has kicked out a nuclear deterrent becoming a member of NATO. Now, I've only got one minute left, but of course, we know the story for the next six weeks is Trident will go and the money released will go on everything. It's only a 20th of the defence budget, but it's going to be conventional defence. A lot of Keith Brown's speech was about that. The last speech was health and, and education, and, and somebody else wanted to spend it on new jobs at Fads Lane. Uh, this is just a, a referendum ploy, of course it is. It won't solve the financial problems faced by an independent Scotland. It won't contribute to international disarmament. It's just an anti-Westminster stick and a pawn in the referendum game. And as someone who has opposed Trident for three and a half decades, I strongly object to Trident being used as a pawn in the referendum game. And the more people think about it, the more they will see it is not a good argument for voting yes. Many thanks.
I now call on Joan McAlpine to be followed by Stuart McMillan. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I come from Gourock on the Clyde, and my family still live there. So this subject is something very close to my heart, as well as the family home. Um, I come from a family of uh, sailors, Clyde sailors, and my father and grandfather have always kept modest boats at Inverkip and Greenock and Port Glasgow. So my childhood memories are defined by sailing to different parts of the Clyde and exploring lochs and coves and Cowell and Kintyre. And I remember as a child it really seemed like God's country um, going to those places to Loch Long and Carrick Castle. It was a really formative experience and you got a real sense of freedom from it. But as children, we soon began to realise that this country wasn't our own and uh, that the freedom was illusory. I remember sailing up Loch Long in my father's boat and being stopped by a military patrol boat who said that we couldn't sail to the western side of the loch because it was too close to the Coolport base. So I described it as God's country and that's what it felt like, but very clearly God's country has been polluted by a great evil. The destructive power of this weapon is almost beyond our comprehension, so I think it's quite important just to remind ourselves of just how destructive it is. The bomb in Hiroshima killed 200,000 people. The bombs that are carried on the Clyde sub are eight times more powerful than that, and there are a great many of them because each sub carries up to 16 missiles, each of which carries 12 bombs. So that means that we have on the Clyde less than 10 kilometres from where my family live and thousands of other people. Um, a sub, one submarine has a, destruct, a destructive power 15 times greater than that which destroyed Hiroshima. I therefore find it strange to hear some members suggesting that removing these weapons from Scotland would not make us safer. The MOD has modelled the possibility of an accident at the shiplifting facility in Faz Lane. And it concluded that this is, quotes, the societal contamination that could result means, quotes, the, risk, the risks are close to the tolerability criterion level. The tolerability criterion level. That's like one of those jargonistic military phrases, a bit like collateral damage. It means that lots and lots of people would be killed, but that that loss of life from the UK MOD's point of view is somehow tolerable. I would also point out that um, the weapons, it's very clear that the weapons have nowhere else to go. I would point to Rob Edwards' report in The Guardian last year, in which the MOD itself revealed that the safety arrangements for Devonport do not per permit the presence of submarines carrying Trident nuclear warheads. In a response under the Freedom of Information Law, the MOD indicated to The Guardian that neither the Devonport Naval Base nor the dockyard um, is, the, is the safety case, is there a safety case to permit the berthing of armed Vanguard class submarines? And the Freedom of Information request also disclosed that the MOD's internal safety watchdog, the Defence Nuclear Safety Regulator, has, quotes, not provided any advice on the feasibility of docking an armed Vanguard class submarine in the dockyard. The Guardian goes on to explain that that is because 166,000 people live within five kilometres of Devonport compared to 5,200 within that distance of Faz Lane. I believe that the lives that could be lost if there was an accident at Faz Lane are just as precious as those which could be lost if there was a similar accident at Devonport. And one should say that that is obviously hypothetical because, as I explained, uh, the destructive power of these weapons, we don't know what kind of accident we are talking about. And obviously it has the, the power to kill a great many more people than that. It's quite clear that the MOD's Freedom of Information response shows that the weapons can't go to Devonport. And the MOD did consider... Uh, alternative UK sites back in 81 and 82 and it concluded that it was too controversial and expensive to start from scratch and we should remember that it took 14 years to adapt Faz Lane and Coolport for Trident. Um, building from scratch would take much longer 
Therefore, removing Trident from the Clyde would remove it from the UK, whatever the people around, other people around this chamber have said. That is why CND have taken a position on independence as the easiest and most achievable way of removing nuclear weapons from the entire UK. And that's why I have great pleasure in supporting this motion today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And now call Stuart McMillan to be followed by John Finney. Thank you very much, President Officer. Today we have yet another opportunity to state the case either for or against Trident renewal. Uh, and I do suspect that at 5pm uh, tonight's votes uh, will be akin to previous votes. Now, that does not make this debate any less important, though. Debating the issue of Trident renewal is important at any time. And certainly one thing is for sure, that the policy decision of Trident renewal does matter to many, many people across Scotland and also across the rest of the UK. And as such, it matters in the current debate over Scotland's future. Now, I've stated my case before, and I'll state it again today, that I disagree uh, with the renewal of the Trident programme and also disagree with nuclear weapons. And I believe that the money for, nuclear, the, for the nuclear programme can actually be better invested in other policy areas. And I genuinely believe that Trident renewal is a missed opportunity by the UK Government and that the only way that we can remove Trident from Scotland is to vote yes next month. We are consistently told that nuclear weapons are a deterrent uh, from some big bad bogeyman. Uh, in the past it was the USSR and we saw, that the, saw the increase in the nuclear arms race as a consequence. But nowadays the threat need not come from a country but from individuals or from groups that have a particular cause. And the existence of nuclear weapons in Scotland has not stopped these individuals or groups undertaking their actions. Having nuclear weapons did not prevent an attack in Glasgow Airport nor on public transport in London. And one of the areas of discussion and this referendum debate is about Faz Lane and its future. Faz Lane will have a future. The White Paper states that we plan that Faz Lane will be an independent Scotland's, will be an independent Scotland's main conventional Navy base and will also be home to the HQ for Navy and Joint Forces HQ for all of Scotland's armed forces. And I'm sure that we can all agree that an independent Scotland requires defence capabilities and a base. And this is where Faz Lane, uh, in a moment, this is where Faz Lane will come into its own. It will require to be reshaped, which will create job opportunities uh, for conventional forces. I'll take your intervention. Jackie Mr. Bailey. Thanks, Stuart McMillan, for taking the intervention. When I asked Keith Brown how many of the naval personnel would be retained at the base, he said the same number. Yet on page 239 of the White Paper, it says these arrangements will require around 2,000 regular and at least 200 reserve personnel. Where have the rest gone? Stuart McMillan. I'm going to put on to the, the, that particular issue right now. Furthermore, the comments, uh, certainly that, uh, that people from the No campaign have actually raised in the past, some of the comments of thousands of job losses are actually disingenuous and do little to inspire any confidence in politicians and the work that we are supposed to do. By all means, highlight uh, legitimate concerns where they exist, but please don't pluck numbers out of thin air, claim them to be fact, and pass them off to be above scrutiny. Stop treating the electorate for fools. Presiding officer, at the weekend, uh, when I was out canvassing, I, I was speaking to a teacher uh, who actually wasn't aware that the UK didn't have a written constitution and that the UK shared this dubious accolade with Israel and New Zealand. And she was furious and she was asking how any nation can actually act in such a manner. Uh, but with independence, we have that opportunity for Scotland to have a written constitution. We have that opportunity for Scotland to have uh, a, written a written constitution. Furthermore, we have the opportunity to ensure that constitutionally we can rid Scotland of nuclear weapons. What a fantastic legacy that would be for our future generations. With independence, we can secure the future of Faz Lane and the jobs that are there. With independence, we can rid Scotland of nuclear weapons and aim to do this in the first term of an independent Scottish Parliament. And with independence, we can create a new Scotland by having a written constitution that is sorely missing at UK level. And in that constitution, we can guarantee no nuclear weapons in Scotland again. In years to come, that's a legacy I will be proud to explain to my daughters that I helped create. And I'm sure it's also a legacy that future generations will thank us for, as compared to blaming us for failing to act when we actually had the chance. Independence offers us that same opportunity to take responsibility, to rid ourselves of Trident and thus save our economy billions of wasted expenditure. It's estimated that by the mid-2020s, Trident renewal will cost the UK £4 billion per annum. That's a huge amount of money. It's wasted it's estimated that Trident renewal will cost up to £100 billion uh, at present cost, 2012 costs. What a huge waste of money. If we didn't have nuclear weapons 
and the nuclear submarines. Just think of the other opportunities that could open up. We know there's oil on the west coast of Scotland. We know that Westminster governments have refused drilling licences to extract that oil. We also know that to extract oil requires huge investment in equipment and rigs and service vessels, not to mention workers. What kind of oil boom could be generated for Ayrshire, Inverclyde, Argyll and Butte? The member is closing, I'm afraid, to the member out of time. Presiding officer, the economic case for nuclear weapons doesn't stack up and actually hampers job, job security, job creation and investment. I would back in the motion in the government's name tonight. Thank you. John Finney to be followed by Christian Allard. Uh, thank you very much indeed, President Officer. I should first declare my membership of Scottish CND. Um, the Trident weapon system is the easiest we can use to illustrate a, a perversity of thought and futility of expenditure, which is not unique to the UK. Indeed, of course, the Trident nuclear system is heavily dependent on the US in many ways. What, the obligation in every country, and, and less with the, the, the minister here, is to assess the risks that a country faces and put in place mechanisms to address these risks. And I would commend the report by the Reid Foundation, No Need to Be Afraid, which highlighted that the risks shared with many countries relate to things like the continuity of energy and food, water, not really a challenge for Scotland, um, and cyber attack. Uh, and Trident, as many others have said, and other systems, uh, have done nothing to uh, offset these particular risks. I think what we need is uh, uh, human security, and if I can quote from the UN Commission on Human Security from 2003, human security means protecting vital freedoms. It means protecting people from critical and pervasive threats and situations, building on their strengths and aspirations. It also means creating systems that give people the building blocks of survival, dignity and livelihood. To do this, it offers two general strategies, protection and empowerment. Protection shields people from dangers. Empowerment enables people to develop their potential and become full participants in decision-making. Now, I, I like the word speedy and safe withdrawal. Um, I don't see that as withdrawal from Scotland. I see that as withdrawal from service. And I think that's a rich prize to gain and a, a rich contribution to give to the world. Um, I like the words in the, in the uh, Minister's motion which suggests collaborative working. I commend my colleague Patrick Harvey's, which enhances that and indeed brings in the, the constitutional element, and I, I hope that the government will support that. This is a very small planet that we all occupy, and it's a, I see a very important role for the UN. Um, I, I understand the very first resolution of the General Assembly of the United Nations, uh, which was adopted unanimously, called for the elimination of nuclear weapons, and there's been many, many fine words along these lines. I'm going to quote some more to you. I call upon the scientific community in our country, those who gave us nuclear weapons, to turn their great talents to the cause of mankind and world peace, to give us the means for rendering these nuclear weapons important and obsolete. Very, very fine words indeed. When you know that they have been uttered by President Ronald Reagan, perhaps it takes some of the edge off it. And, and I would ask, how have the scientific community turned their attention to the cause of mankind? The cause of mankind will never, ever be served by the creation of more weapons better weapons, smarter weapons. The drone wars, that cowardly compact with an equally flawed legal basis for waging it. It's interesting, a, a US president calls on scientists to turn their talents to world peace. In an unequal world, police will, uh, police will always be more likely if we see progress for mankind. And that progress would come with things like eradicating malaria AIDS. That would do far more for humanity than uh, nuclear weapons. Of course, uh, there's growing inequality around the globe, and that could lead to conflict. So it's important that we share uh, our resources with the developing world. Um, arms diversification is the future, as I see it, and I commend that reference in the, the government's white paper. Not everything that goes with these comments. We know that foreign and defence policies are inextricably linked, and I would like to commend some things that have happened in Scotland in the past. So, for instance, the Edinburgh Conversations. This city played its part at the time of throwing in relations in the Cold War, high-level discussions with academics and uh, military people hopefully contributed to uh, making the world a better place. The talks in Craig Elachie about concerns, uh, the dispute in the Caucasus, I think that's the future I want to see for Scotland. It's about, for me, talks, not tanks, talks, not trident. I think there is a glorious opportunity and where I would differ from the Minister, to me, it's not about defence procurement. It's about having a new outlook, a new Scotland, an outward-looking Scotland, committed to social and environmental justice. We have one world, world, one humanity. And if we work together, and if people like my colleague Neil Finlay focuses his mind on this, he will see that if he's genuinely committed to the eradication of nuclear weapons, there is but one route to go with that. Yes, of course. 
Neil Finlay. I hope Mr Swinney will reflect on that when he emphasised genuinely. There are many people on this side who are genuinely have that interest. So don't just assume that it's on one side of the argument that people have genuine conviction in, on this. That's an insult. John Finney, and you must conclude soon. Yes, uh, well, well, it's an insult you misheard, Mr Finlay, because what I was actually was commending your position on it and saying that given that position, we should all work together for a better cause. And the likelihood is that is not going to be delivered with the present constitutional settlement. The likelihood is that that will be delivered with a strong will. That's what, that's what will deliver this. It's not bits of paper. It is a commitment. And I don't doubt for one second the commitment of this government and people on the yes side to deliver that better world. Thank you very much. I call Christian Allard to be followed by Lewis MacDonald and speeches must be under five minutes. Point of order, Fiona MacLeod. Could I have Fiona MacLeod's microphone, please? Unfortunately, the screen is not showing that your card is in. Could you check that it's in properly, please? Could you perhaps move to the next council? Fiona MacLeod, point of order. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. And it is a genuine point of order. I'm seeking your advice. Um, my can you intervene on a member in the middle of their speech when you haven't been there to listen to their speech? I'd, re I'd, I'd appreciate your ruling on that. It's entirely up to the member whether the member wishes to take an intervention, and that's something that the member who's taking the intervention has to make a judgment on. Uh, we're now extremely short of time. The next three speakers will have to adjust their timings accordingly. Christian Allard to be followed by Lewis MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I'm delighted to speak today in this debate. Today we mark the 69th anniversary of the first use of nuclear weapons against the people of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Tonight, I'll be joining the Aberdeen and District Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament Group, which I am a member of, uh, to commemorate the event at the Fisherman's Hut on the River Dee in Aberdeen. I will be speaking, speaking at the event as a member of the Scottish Parliament for the North East, as a member of Scottish campaign for nuclear disarmament, just like Neil Filney, but a lot more active than Neil Filney, and I will invite him to come to the debate of the CND and to be there because he's missed. We need a voice like him to, to, to have a proper views and a different views that somehow we can get rid of nuclear weapons in 50 years' time. Uh, and as a member of the International Group for Parliamentarian for Nuclear Non-Proliferation and Disarmament, the PNND, presenting officer, a group that I joined just after I became a parliamentarian in May last year. As in previous years, on the beautiful banks of the D, speakers from a variety of political, community and faith groups will commemorate the catastrophic event and will warn the many people attending against the renewal of the UK's own weapons of mass destruction, Trident. Let me take this opportunity, presiding officer, to call on the people of Aberdeen and across Aberdeenshire to join us tonight from 8.30 p.m. One of the speakers is the uh, Aberdeen Mosque and the Islamic Center Imam, Imam Ibrahim. When Scotland's Cabinet Secretary for Justice, Kenny McCaskill, came to give his support to Aberdeen Mosque and Islamic Centre last month, Aberdeen Central MSP Kevin Stewart, and I heard how much Imam Ibrahim appreciated the Scottish Government's support on Palestine. A few weeks later, I shared a platform with Imam Ibrahim speaking on what is happening in Gaza today. And again, Imam Ibrahim welcomed the Scottish Government's actions in support of Palestine. Imam Ibrahim talked of peace and how his own family was trapped in Palestine. Presenting officer, if nuclear weapons were supposed to keep the world at peace, I would not be talking about Gaza today. I really look forward to Imam Ibrahim's contribution tonight. I'm also looking forward to his contribution of Hilda Meers, our 90 years old poet in the Northeast, a member of the Scottish Jews for a just peace. She won't be able to attend tonight, but her words will resonate as some of us will read a selection of her poems. One voice tonight I will struggle to agree with. Presenting officer is the voice of another Labour politician telling the world that they should disarm while voting for the UK to renew its nuclear weapon system. 
trident. Many other voices have parted company with this nonsense and now join us campaigning for an independent Scotland free from nuclear weapons. The people of Scotland are seeing through the same old and endless rhetoric from Labour and all other Westminster parties. Both political parties have no intention of getting rid of the UK nuclear weapons. I agree with Bruce Kent, who came to see us this week, that a yes vote in September will lead to the removal of immoral and illegal trident from Fastlane and Scotland. Despite uh, the sentence I have used in many public meetings uh, the past few months, as we all attended, maybe not Mr. Finlay, that a yes vote won't change a thing. I did say in many public meetings that a yes vote won't change a thing. It is what we do afterwards that matters. Please draw to a close. Let me assure you, President Officer, that one thing we know will change is that Trident is for the dustbin and won't be renewed. Today, we are commemorating what happened in Japan 69 years ago. In 40 days, here in Scotland, our answer will be yes. Yes to a nuclear weapons free Scotland. Thank you very much. I call Lewis MacDonald to be followed by Mark MacDonald. I can only give you four minutes each. I apologise. Thank you very much. In this week of all weeks, we should not make the mistake of thinking we can address our strategic issues of defence and security in isolation from the wider world. 100 years ago this week, the British government of the day had to decide whether or not to resist Germany's conquest of Belgium. 75 years ago next month, another British government had to make a very similar decision whether to go to war over Germany's invasion of Poland. Those governments took the tough decisions to go to war in both 1914 and 1939. And like so many other Scottish men and women, my grandfathers and my father lived with what happened in frontline service on land and sea. If we are serious this week about commemoration and about learning from history, we must not abstract the question of defence from our shared experience or from the realities of strategic choices facing our country and our friends in the 21st century. The key driver of strategic policy since 1945 has been the unity of Western European and North American countries in the North Atlantic Alliance. NATO is not an economic association like the European Union. It is a military and strategic alliance where each member state promises to come to the aid of any other member state which is attacked by a third party. So the first question for any candidate member of NATO is not the nuclear question, it is whether or not to give that undertaking to meet armed force with armed force if the need arises. But if the SNP's answer is yes, that they would be willing to give that commitment in the event they were the government of an independent Scotland, then they would have to answer the nuclear question too. As long as nuclear weapons exist, NATO will remain a nuclear alliance. That's not a matter of my opinion, it is a matter of policy as spelled out in the strategic concept adopted by Member States in 2010 as NATO's roadmap for the rest of this decade and indeed in every previous strategic concept too. There are of course Member States of NATO which do not have nuclear weapons on their territory, but there is by definition no Member State of NATO which rejects the deployment of nuclear weapons as a component of NATO's collective defence. The strategic concept is the agreed policy of all members of the North Atlantic Council and by definition is supported by every NATO member state. So those then members of the SNP who said in 2012, if you vote to join NATO, you will not get rid of Trident, were absolutely right. And they were right in that respect to this day. NATO's strategy is to retain and deploy nuclear weapons. The UK is one of three nuclear armed NATO members. Scotland is where the UK's nuclear weapons are currently deployed. An independent Scotland, whose first strategic priority was to remove those weapons, would clearly be opposing the policy not just of the UK, but of NATO as a whole. And the idea that an independent Scotland could simultaneously expel Trident and join the Atlantic Alliance is not credible from either side of the argument. I will. Minister. Can I thank Lewis McDonald for taking the intervention? Just say much of his case is built upon the US or wider NATO uh, view, as he sees it, that they would insist on uh, Scotland retaining nuclear weapons. But is he aware of the International Herald Tribune, which says, uh, quotes a US official saying, they can't afford, they, the UK can't afford Trident, and they need to confront the choice. Either they can be a nuclear power and nothing else, or a real military partner. The US does not want us well, to have that. Lewis McDonald, your final makes a very helpful point, because there's a decision yet to be made about the future of Britain's nuclear weapons capability after 
2016. And that is a decision in which many people in Scotland would want to have a say as citizens of the United Kingdom. A decision by the UK to remain a nuclear armed power would carry much the same risk for a Scotland out with the UK as it would if we remained as part of the Union. And a UK decision not to replace Trident would have significant implications for NATO and likewise would impact on Scotland whether or not we were part of the UK. Surely the best way to influence the future debate on nuclear weapons in Britain, in NATO and on a global scale is to stay in the UK, stay in the Atlantic Alliance and make sure our voices are heard and our interests are considered when those decisions are made, not to walk away and leave the big strategic decisions of our century you for someone go. else to make. Thank you very much. Mark MacDonald, four minutes, please. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. One day, uh, Mr Smith, who lives in a quiet street, uh, feels unsafe and feels insecure. So he decides to go out and buy himself a gun in order to protect himself and his family. He arrives home with the gun, knowing that it's only for him to protect himself and to deter any threats that may occur. His neighbour across the street spots him arriving home with the gun and thinks to himself, we must live in an unsafe street. I'd better go out and buy a gun. And so it is with the idea of nuclear deterrence. It is there to protect us from a threat that doesn't actually exist. And Annabel Goldie said as much in her speech, a threat that no longer exists, but just in case. Just in case out there somebody develops a nuclear capability and also would choose to target it against us in the event that they did so. But the point about this is uh, that you know, renewing the Trident nuclear capability, whatever the size of that capability and the idea that somehow reducing the size of a nuclear deterrent is therefore, a, is therefore you know, an acceptable thing to do. One nuclear warhead is one nuclear warhead too many, as far as I'm concerned. So it doesn't matter about reducing the size. Unless you're reducing that to zero, I'm not interested frankly. But the idea that somehow the message that is sent out to those states who may or may not be in a position of trying to currently uh, develop nuclear weapons capability of renewing the Trident system, the message that that sends out to them is not that we are serious about nuclear disarmament, it's that we are serious about the continuation of nuclear deterrence or uh, lack of deterrence in the current international system. And I think that we need to get beyond this idea that we are defending ourselves by having trident on our shores. I'm not suggesting that we are necessarily making ourselves a target, but at the same time, there is no defence for trident because trident itself is no defence. The idea as well that we should focus this down on the, on the position of jobs. Now, I understand and accept that there will be jobs that are linked to the current uh, the current. Uh, presence of Trident on the Clyde. But firstly, I have a difficulty with supporting something of the uh, ilk of nuclear weapons on the basis that jobs are attached to it, because I believe that the amount of money that is spent on Trident would be far better served supporting far more jobs being deployed in other forms and other, uh, in other ways. And indeed, if we look at... I'm sorry, I only have four minutes, Mr Finney, but trust me, we're on the same page on this anyway. Uh, on a 2007 report uh, commissioned by Scottish CND and the STUC, amongst whose authors was the Labour MSP Claudia Beamish, at the time Chair of Scottish Labour, concluded that a renewal of Trident could place at risk up to 3,000 public service jobs. Few jobs resulting from investment in Trident replacement are likely to come to Scotland. So what we are likely to see are risks elsewhere because of the removal of funding in order to front finance Trident. And I say that I don't doubt for one second the sincerity of members in their position on disarmament. I don't doubt that at all. What I do doubt is the faith that they have that this would be resolved by means other than a yes vote. Because we are often told by the Labour Party, the Labour Party's position on the referendum is not so much vote no, it is vote no and then hopefully vote Labour and elect Labour in 2015 and everything will be all right. That's a leap of faith and a leap of logic that they have to justify. The leap of faith that has to be justified on this is not just vote no and then vote Labour in 2015. It's vote no, vote Labour in 2015 and hope beyond hope that the prevailing voices within Labour are those of Malcolm Chisholm and Neil Findlay, not those of Jim Murphy and Jackie Bailey. And that is the difficulty that the Labour Party has to reconcile, is 
that it cannot come to the table and say with any categorical assurance that a no vote would result in a no vote to Trident. What we can say Must categorically close. is that while the world sits around the table waiting for somebody to blink, a yes vote gives us the opportunity to be the first ones to do so and to lead the way internationally. Thank you very much. We now turn to closing speeches and I remind members that if they have participated in this debate, they should be in the chamber for closing speeches. I call on Patrick Harvey. Up to six minutes, please. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I begin uh, by taking on this suggestion that those of us uh, who are voting yes and support disarmament all disrespect or, or resent in some way the diversity of views that exist uh, on the other side of the independence debate? Uh, in, in the Green Party, you will be pretty hard-pressed to find anyone who wants to hang on to Trident. But you will find some, a small minority of our members, who will be voting no and who are not convinced uh, of the case for independence. We're capable of having that debate in a spirit of respect and friendship. And it's important for me uh, to say that because that's the spirit of debate that I think Scotland deserves. And I respect the position, uh, even though I disagree with it, that's taken by some uh, in the Labour Party who recognise that only a small minority uh, of their members or MSPs might consider voting yes, uh, but who do support the principle of disarmament. Michael McMahon says this is not a nationalistic issue, uh, and I agree. This goal should be able to unite us across the independence divide. I merely suggest to those in my own party and others who are voting no and who want disarmament, I merely suggest that we should apply the same test of realpolitik that Malcolm Chisholm suggests that we think about in the context of post-yes negotiations. There may well be people on the Labour benches and elsewhere who are utterly sincere, I'm convinced that they are, uh, of their values on disarmament. But we know which way the 2016 decision is going to go. If the UK Parliament in any conceivable balance of power after the 2015 election makes that decision, we know that it will renew Trident. Let's be honest about that reality. The economic argument has also been made and explored. Now, there is an economic argument for getting rid of Trident. It's not the one that I put to the top of my list most often in these debates, because frankly, I'd be for scrapping the thing even if it cost us money instead of saving us money to do so. To me, I, I can acknowledge that you'll hear a range of priorities about how best to use the 100 billion or so that would be saved over the long term by not replacing Trident. I could write you a long list myself. Personally, I regard that debate as the icing on the cake, the privilege of being able to debate what our priorities would be for that money. Let's face it, there's work that needs doing in our society, work with a social, economic and environmental benefit to our society uh, and the, the opportunity to create dramatically more jobs than Trident could ever create uh, is one that I look forward to being able to debate. I, I thank, Kevin Stewart. Uh, I thank Mr Harvey for giving way um, and I too uh, want to be able to have that de debate about priorities about where we spend that money. Do you think that uh, the UK government should be open and transparent and say what is going to be cut to actually pay for this new nuclear weapon system if they go ahead with it? Patrick Harvey. Well I, I suppose I would welcome that but let's face it that's not going to happen either. Uh, that this is a, an ideological position. The, the strategic arguments, I think, have often been lacking. Uh, any kind of strategic argument that says why possessing this nuclear weapon system is a good idea. Uh, Annabel Goldie got the closest to it. She seemed to suggest, though, that the strategic concept hasn't changed much since the Cold War, or that somehow we need to have nuclear weapons in order not to have nuclear war. This seems uh, a very bizarre argument to me. The promise, let's remember, the promise at the beginning of this bizarre psychological experiment of mutually assured destruction is that it would keep the peace. Not that it would only prevent nuclear war, but it would prevent these power blocks from attacking each other conventionally as well. This has monumentally failed. And of course it failed. It's based on the dehumanizing ideology of game theory. At no point has anyone proposed an actual strategic benefit from possession of a weapon that could only ever be used if the finger on the button belongs to a psychopath. The arguments around a written constitution have been raised as well, and 
I know there are arguments for and against a single codified written constitution, and Ian Gray and I have had that debate before. But whether we look at a single constitutional document or hundreds of years of constitutional documentation, constitutions should not just be about a dry approach uh, to the, the mechanisms of government. It should convey something about how we conceive ourselves, what kind of country we are, our values and ambitions, and a commitment to peace should be central in that. Not only, as John Finney says, opposing weapons of mass destruction, but building the economic, social and environmental justice around the world, which is the only long-term protection for human security and the only way for our world to move beyond the obsession with war and the aggressive projection of military power. The final point I'd like to make, Deputy Presiding Officer, is to colleagues in the SNP. I haven't heard this argument from the leadership, and I'm pleased about it. I have from others colleagues in the SNP who suggest that Trident has been used by the MOD to block the exploitation of oil on the West Coast. If so, that's the only useful utility Trident ever gave us. And swapping one weapon of mass destruction for another is not the vision I subscribe to if anyone ever sees the abolition of Trident as an excuse for the exploitation of oil from the West Coast. Believe me, there will still be protest, there will still be debate, and I'll still be willing to risk arrest to stop it. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Many thanks. I now call on Willie Rennie. Up to six minutes, please. As predicted, this has been a debate that's been marked by tired slogans and old songs. It gives us, I suppose, some confidence to the nationalist supporters in a campaign that is failing to secure the necessary momentum. But I suspect it will fail to convince many undecided voters. It's not an argument that I suspect will carry much traction in the West Coast. It's not much, it won't attract much support across the country because it has been seen as a bogus argument. It is not going to result in the claims that they make. It also poses a real challenge to those who believe it will save money, advance world peace and keep us safer. It's been exposed forensically, I think, this afternoon by numerous members. Um, Malcolm Chisholm with his trident nimbyism, which I thought was a, an excellent description um, of the SNP proposition. Neil Findlay, a passionate supporter and member of CND, who quite rightly believes that he can achieve his ambition through the route of the United Kingdom. And Ian Gray, who described it as redeployment rather than disarmament. Moving it south of the border, flitting it to another part of the United Kingdom doesn't necessarily make the world any safer. He's also rightly criticised, Ian Gray has rightly criticised the SNP for using this as a tactic in the referendum, for somehow claiming that only through this route can we achieve nuclear disarmament. I think the passion that has been showed by many on the Labour benches for disarmament is an indication that there is um, a strong group of people who are campaigning relentlessly for that ambition. And it's a tactic we know that has been found favour in many other areas as well. The fact that they argue that the one hand we should be nuclear free, but on the other hand, we should be a member of NATO, which we know has been a member of the NATO alliance, the umbrella that that provides. That means that there will be a requirement to agree that nuclear weapons, nuclear submarines will be allowed into Scottish waters. So on the one hand, we're sending Trident down south, but on the other hand, we're allowing them back into our own waters. That is an inconsistent position that Jean Urquhart has quite rightly highlighted as being inconsistent. She has said that membership of NATO would be a barrier to removal of Trident, and she is right in that one respect. And I know from the 90s that in my own part of the world, that the SNP campaigned vigorously for the refitting and refuelling facility um, to be based at Rosyth, somehow managing to match those two inconsistent positions together. They don't want them in our waters, but they're quite happy for them to be refitted right here in Scotland. That inconsistent position is riddled through their policy. It's, that's why I think many people are sceptical, and quite rightly, they are sceptical for that, not just now. But the tactic also extends to the vision on savings, on the savings. And Ian Gray again highlighted the, the many times that the money has been spent 
um, over and over again. The savings would be spent on defence, on childcare, on youth um, unemployment, on many, many areas, including personal care pensions, free tuition fees, welfare spending, schools and teachers. So not only, not only is it going to be spent on the defence of Scotland, but it's also going to be spent in these many other areas. Many people have been promised this extra spending will be extremely disappointed after independence to, dis to discover that that promise will not be able to be fulfilled. And we've discovered also this afternoon from Gil Patterson that every single penny, not only every single penny of the Trident expenditure will be spent in Faz Lane, but there will also be cuts from other public services in order to fund the full amount, the up to the 8,000 jobs, because we know from Jackie Bailey that the 8,000 people that are employed in Faz Lane just now would be reduced to 2,000, because that's what it says in the white paper. So I assume there must be cuts to public services in other areas, and that's something that I suspect that Gil Patterson is perhaps in full uh, support of. But what this debate has also revealed, uh, there has been a lack of any interest in any other areas of defence. As I said earlier on, 5% of the defence budget, that's what Trident accounts for. 95% has been ignored this afternoon. Now, let's consider the issues that need to be scrutinised. For instance, in the White Paper, it says we're going to have two frigates, four mine countermeasures. We're going to have two OPVs. We're going to have four to six patrol boats, auxiliary ships, 12 Typhoon jets, six Hercules 1 C-130J aircraft, 15,000 permanent personnel and 5,000 in reserve. Now, both of those, all of those, are based on the assumption that every single member of the Scottish, of Scottish member of the UK Armed Forces will agree to come back to an independent Scotland and serve in a Scottish Defence Force in the exact configurations that is required for a Scottish Defence Force. But there will also be, it's based on an assumption, that the UK Government will agree to the division of assets. Now, what I want to know from the Minister, perhaps when he's winding up, is will he explain if that does not come about? What are the alternatives? What's the plan B? What happens if the people don't come back? What happens if we don't get that division of assets? They are more interested in the old songs, in the tired slogans, than the realities of a defence budget. And the sooner they understand that, the greater the chance they've got in the referendum. Thank, Thank you. you very much. I call on Alex Johnson. Maximum six minutes, please. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. This has been a debate that has thrown up a mix of speeches, some excellent speeches on both sides of the divide, and some right rubbish in the middle, as usual. One of the issues that was raised by Patrick Harvey was the history that got us where we are today. However, in spite of the fact that Patrick Harvey gave a, gave a good description, what he did fail to do was go right back to the start of nuclear weapons. History tells us that Back in the 1940s, it became clear that a fascist regime that was waging unconditional war across Europe was in the act of developing not only nuclear weapons, but the means by which to deliver them through missiles. The governments of the Allied nations at that time decided to come together to work on a single project to develop a nuclear weapon that would act as a counter threat to any nuclear weapon with which we were threatened. The Manhattan Project brought together the best brains available to us on the planet in the United States and here in Britain, but ironically also many, many Jewish uh, exiles from the countries occupied by that fascist regime. By the time the Manhattan Project had succeeded in creating that weapon, the war in Europe was over. The research project within Germany had failed to deliver that weapon. These very scientists were the first people to campaign against the use of the nuclear weapon that they had devised. No thank you. As we reach the point where we are discussing, as has been discussed by some today, the 69th anniversary of the use of that weapon, first on Hiroshima and then subsequently on Nagasaki, I have to express my regret that that decision was ever made. But I, unlike Patrick Harvey, do not have the benefit of 2020 hindsight. And the people who made these decisions made them for reasons that they were present or uh, available to them at the time. 
In fact, before we leave history, it should also be noted that many people in the United States and here in the United Kingdom were convicted of treason for leaking the secrets of these weapons quite deliberately to the Soviet Union and to other countries, believing that they were doing so in order to create the very balance which we have talked about today as keeping the peace over many generations. No, I will not give way because I am expressing a view that differs from yours and, like your leader, you seek to talk over those with whom you disagree. That Through is chair, not please. an acceptable practice in politics and I will not permit those who wish to do that to intervene. We went on to hear uh, about Annabel Go uh, Audrey, from Annabel please. Goldie about the issues uh, which have been raised uh, that concern us regarding the Cold War. Yes, nuclear weapons did have the effect of bringing about the Cold War and keeping the peace, but no, they did not keep peace in conventional terms. And that's why we should always be concerned to ensure that as we go forward, we understand what nuclear disarmament and non-proliferation are about. This country has done a great deal to ensure that non-proliferation uh, has been, uh, pro uh, been encouraged and developed. Sadly, the number of nations that have acquired nuclear uh, weapons just in recent years uh, has increased, but this country has done its bit to ensure that it did not find that uh, technology from here. Nuclear disarmament, however, is something that people understand in different ways and at different times. The, there are those who argue for uh, unilateral nuclear disarmament. I will never argue for that because I believe the unilateral nu nuclear disarmament, especially in a country that has done its bit to keep the peace, uh, is not going to deliver our objective in the long term. We have seen over uh, the, the recent uh, past, uh, in fact the distant past, the strategic arms limitation talks succeeding in vastly reducing the number of weapons that were being held by the major protagonists in the Cold War. What we need to do now is ensure that that uh, multilateral approach is continued. Here in Scotland, we have to understand what the right position to take is. Those within the Scottish National Party and certain others, but not all, uh, within the, the, who support the Yes campaign have made the mistake of believing that the presence and the renewal of Trident are subjects on which they can gain some political credence. I believe they are wrong. I believe that information contained within recent opinion surveys demonstrate that the people of Scotland have a far more substantial understanding of what nuclear weapons are about and how we would best dispose of them than do those who have spoken from the government's backbenches today. The truth is that the loss of Trident would cost Scotland jobs, that it would cost Scotland uh, credibility in the longer term. And what we, would we get from that? Well, the money that would be saved to an independent Scotland's budget by not having to fund uh, the replacement of Trident would, in fact, uh, not be able to achieve the objectives that they have set out. As has been described by many, Angus Robertson says it will all go into the military budget. Annabel Ewan regularly says it will plug the gap in welfare, in spite of the fact that if you add it up, it doesn't come to a quarter of what would require uh, for her to spend. And yes, it's been, spent on, uh, it's been spent on youth employment, education, colleges, you name it, they will spend it. I'm afraid you're out of time. This is unfortunately a cynical ploy of a desperate campaign running out of steam. Not in my backyard Mr. is Johnson, not a basis for conclude. a system of government and it's not a basis for a constitutional change. Thank you. Now Colin Jackie Bailey, maximum eight minutes, please. Presiding officer, I'm not naturally a cynic, but I suspect that much of our time in the next few weeks will be... I, I, it would appear that the front bench disagree. But, oh, you know, much of the time in the next few weeks will be spent debating issues to the UK Parliament's responsibility all in an attempt to further the cause of the SNP's campaign for independence. Now, might I suggest to them as gently as I can that after the First Minister's performance last night, they might want to have a debate about currency, because after all, the people of Scotland do deserve answers to this most fundamental of questions. 
That said, I fully understand and sympathise with the SNP's clear need to create a diversion. It is the oldest political tactic in the book. Create a distraction, debate anything but the issue of the day, which is currency. But the people of Scotland were not fooled last night. They won't be fooled in the future. So let's have the transparency SNP members have been calling for in this debate. Let's clear the parliamentary diary to have a debate on currency, because I think people would welcome that. Let me turn to Trident. Let me turn to Trident, presiding officer. My timing is impeccable. I have always acknowledged that there are many different views in this chamber, across parties and even within parties. However, wherever you stand... As a unilateralist or a multilateralist, we have a responsibility to consider the consequences of our actions. Members have heard me speak before about the economic impact on Faslane and Coolport, and I make no apology for doing so again. There are currently 11,000 jobs dependent on the base. 6,700 employed directly at Faslane and Coolport, and that's the most up-to-date figure supplied Audit, by the please. MOD. Then there are further 4,500 jobs in the supply chain using standard income multipliers about local economic impact. It provides £270 million. I want people to hear this because it's constantly questioned. It provides £270 million per year spend in the local area. These figures I haven't made up. These figures are sourced from the ECOS survey done for Scottish Enterprise and Bartonshire about the economic impact of the base. And because of the decision made by the UK government to make Faslane the base for the entire UK submarine fleet, the numbers directly employed are expected to rise to 8,200 by 2022. Now, I'm used to the cybernauts hurling abuse at me on Twitter. I'm used to members in the chamber trying to shout me down. The front bench did it again today. But there is no getting away from these figures. These are facts. These are real people that deserve to know whether they will have jobs if Scotland becomes independent. And my local community, my local community needs to know what the likely impact will be. The jobs at Faslane are not low paid. They're not minimum wage jobs. These are highly skilled workers on good salaries. They account for one quarter of the full-time workforce in Western Bartonshire as a whole. Their loss would have a devastating impact on the local economy. Now, the SNP claim that only 500 jobs are at stake. Then the figure doubled to 1,000. However, the reality is that there would not be a strategic need for the base as currently configured. Angus Robertson, the SNP's defence spokesman, consistently refused to guarantee the number of jobs retained after separation would remain the same. I'll come back to Keith Brown in a minute. John Swinney slashed the budget for defence by more than a third, more than using up any notional savings from Trident. And at the same time, ministers promise extra spending on health, on education. The reality is that the budget is slashed, is all going on conventional defence, according to Angus Robertson and according to Alex Salmond himself in his October 2012 conference speech. The truth is, you haven't got a clue. It's interesting that Stuart Crawford, a defence consultant, in a minute, a defence consultant to whom the SNP used to pay attention before he jumped ship to the Liberals, has said that Faslane would only sustain a thousand jobs in the future. So what precisely are the SNP's plans for the other 10,000? Are they simply to be thrown on the scrap heap? Do they not matter in an independent Scotland? I'll give way to Keith Brown. Minister. Yeah, I wonder if Jackie Bailey could explain. I think the four different figures referred so far for the number of jobs uh, at Faslane from the different parts of the Better Together campaign. And will she acknowledge the STUC's estimate of 1,536 jobs sustained by Trident? Surely, if she's going to peddle a scare story, she should get it right with her colleagues. Jackie Bailey. I'm not peddling a scare story. I've been consistent for 15 years about the economic impact at Faslane. Um, you seek to cloud that because you have no answers on jobs. But at least now, let me give you credit, we can examine some of the SNP's proposals. I understand why you've not told us before what your plans are, because on even the most cursory inspection, they fall apart. I asked the Minister how many naval jobs would be provided. I was told it would be the same. That's 6,700 rising to 8,200. But look at page 239 of the white paper. It simply says 2,000. 
So where are the 4,500 to 6,000 who are short? I'm happy to give way for you to tell me where those jobs are. Minister, well, can before, we conduct the debate through the chair, please, on all sides? Minister. I'm happy to respond, as I did before, to the point by Jackie Bailey by saying that we would guarantee the same number of military jobs at Faslane. What she has to reconcile, though, is all the different figures that her colleagues have given. Four different figures, 8,000, 11,000, 6,000. Which is the right figure, then, Jackie? Jackie can Bailey. I, can I say to the Minister, you know, I asked about naval jobs. There are naval jobs at Faslane. You replied about military jobs. You are going to put these people on the scrap heap. But can I also say, we discovered that Faslane is not a conventional naval base. Well, I could have told you that. It'll take 10 years to reconfigure. So from the outset, at least five of the 13 or so vessels that make up the Scottish Navy won't be able to dock there. No submarines and experts say we are unlikely to get any offshore protection vessels. We would have two frigates. We could order another two. That's interesting. Can I ask what frigates you will build? Because the intellectual property rights for the existing ones belong to the rest of the UK. Minor but important detail. You also need, you also need an ITAL license from the USA to use any of their defence equipment, even a bolt or a screw. Do you even know what that is? Have you even made inquiries about how long that would take? And you will apparently commission the frigates in the first parliament. So two years to negotiate separation, possibly a, four, a further four years before you place the order. So potentially six years before the shipyards get anything to build. What do they do in the meantime? Twiddle their thumbs. I'm told it takes a year to build a frigate. I'm also told that a frigate lasts for 30 to 40 years. A Scottish Navy, even if you replace every single ship in the first few years, will not sustain Scottish shipbuilding. The ministers are laughing. Don't just listen to me. Listen to those who work in the industry, to Babcocks, to BAE Systems, to the trade unions, to the workers at Faslane, Recife and the Clyde. They are the experts, and frankly, they think the SNP's plans are just plain daft. You must Presiding come officer, to a conclusion. Our ambition is to rid the world of nuclear weapons, to achieve global zero. The difference is that the ultimate objective is shared but the mechanism by which you go about it is certainly not shared. The SNP is simply using Trident to win a vote to separate Scotland from the United Kingdom. They are not serious. Thank you very much. Now calling Kenny McCaskill to wind up the debate. Cabinet Secretary, you have until five o'clock. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Can I say I thought the open debate was actually remarkably good. There were a great meal of passionate con uh, con contributions and indeed articulate contributions, even if some I didn't agree with. Uh, it was asked by Annabelle Goldie why we were debating, and I think it's always been the case that this party has, as Patrick Harvey pointed out, as indeed other speakers did, we've always reflected on and sought to commemorate the bombing of Hiroshima. Sometimes it's in a members' debate, sometimes it's been by a parliamentary motion, but I think it is appropriate that we should recollect it. Equally, I think Joan McAlpine made the appropriate point that actually, given the Rubicon crossing as we've moved from the atomic to the nuclear age, it's more important than ever. And the points were made, as Ian Gray touched upon World War I, which it's appropriate to remember as we remember Hiroshima, but it was also points made by Christian Allard, Bill Kidd, and indeed many others, that the possession of nuclear weapons has not stopped wars. We see confrontations ongoing at the very moment as we speak. The world is most certainly not a safer place. A presiding officer, we have heard a range of views during this debate, and as someone who's marched alongside CND in support of nuclear disarmament and against Trident, my position will come as no surprise. But for the first time, the decision on whether or not we continue to be home to Trident nuclear weapons can be in Scotland's hands. On 18 September, the people will decide whether Scotland will again be an independent country. And there are many reasons why I expect the people of Scotland to support that proposition for jobs in the economy, for the improvement, for fairness in our public services and policies, practical reasons which will improve everyday lives. And there will be practical benefits from Trident's withdrawal, such as reducing Scotland's nuclear footprint and freeing up the millions of pounds of Scottish taxpayers' money spent on their upkeep. But the question of nuclear weapons is perhaps most closely tied to our vision of the kind of Scotland we want to be. A responsible and a peaceful Scotland, 
which can take its rightful place in the world without the threat of nuclear weapons that is sought by everyone around the chamber. It is in that context that the Scottish Government will secure the withdrawal of Trident from an independent Scotland. And we will support a constitutional ban on the basing of nuclear weapons in Scotland to secure that withdrawal for future generations, as many speakers, including Christina McKelvey and Stuart McMillan, made clear. This stands in stark contrast with the position of the three main parties in Westminster. They all support the replacement of Trident nuclear weapons, weapons which the UK Government has no intention of relocating away from the Clyde. On 20 March 2013, this Parliament voted in opposition to Trident. The STUC, Scotland's churches and others have also supported that call. Most importantly of all, polls regularly show that majority public opinion in Scotland is opposed to nuclear weapons and to spending on Trident missiles. And yet, we have heard that the UK Government stands ready to confirm in 2016 an investment decision which plans for nuclear weapons to remain in Scotland for the next half century, another 50 years. One thing is clear. Independence is the only option that protects current and future generations from the prospect of nuclear weapons continuing to be based in Scotland against the will of this Parliament and the people we represent. There are three arguments, though. The first is the economic argument. We have heard about the cost at 2012 prices of replacing Trident, lifetime costs of around £100 billion, the equivalent every year of spending 9% of the MOD's current budget on nuclear weapons, not what the military seek, annual costs peaking at around £4 billion a year by the mid-2020s, and Scotland's population share of the equivalent annual outlay being around £240 million per annum. We see that renewing Trident would bring huge uncertainty for future conventional defence procurement. But to do so when one million people in Scotland and many more across the UK are reliving in poverty is doubly wrong. Presiding officer, the Scottish Government believes that it is wrong for the UK Government to commit to spending £100 billion on nuclear weapons at the expense of its conventional defence capabilities, and while it continues to slash the social budgets on which those who are in greatest need rely day and daily. There is a, a strategic and military argument. Those who suggest that nuclear weapons are essential to our national security, whatever the cost, I can't accept that. We have heard that the presence of nuclear weapons has not prevented conflicts between nuclear and non-nuclear states, and it could be argued that their possession by a select few could actually encourage others to acquire them, as we have seen. Ultimately, this is no scenario that I can conceive of which justifies the use of Trident nuclear weapons, and that was made clear by many, many other speakers. The consequences would be catastrophic. Nuclear weapons present no deterrent to the threats we face today or those we will face tomorrow. It is time for the UK and for other <laughs> nuclear weapon states to fully embrace the principles of the NPT and to work towards the abolition of nuclear weapons. But it is not just economic and militarily that we make this argument. It is also a moral argument. We cannot forget that these are weapons of mass destruction and that rang out around the chamber. They are indiscriminate and devastating in their impacts. Their use brings unspeakable humanitarian suffering and widespread environmental damage. My view on this issue is therefore simple. There should be no place in Scotland or any state for nuclear weapons. Exactly 90 years ago today, presiding officer, on the 6th of August 1945, which is why we debate it today, or one of the reasons a bomb was dropped on Hiroshima. Three days later, Nagasaki experienced the same fate. Hundreds of thousands of people were killed in horrific circumstances and the impacts remain visible to this day, as we heard from Bill Kidd with his narration from the representatives from that community. 
It is truly disturbing to reflect on the scale of suffering and devastation that nuclear weapons can bring. Above all else, it is to avoid the use of these weapons in the future, whether by accident or by design, that we must commit ourselves to ridding the world of their presence. And we must, presiding officer, do through, through words, but also do through, through deeds. And in conclusion, can I say, only with independence can we secure Trident's withdrawal from Scotland, and only with independence can we, through our written constitution, prohibit the future basing of nuclear weapons on our territory, and only with independence can Scotland take its full place in supporting the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. The decision is in the hands of the people of Scotland, and I therefore call on the Scottish Parliament to support this motion to send a clear message of our commitment to the withdrawal of Trident nuclear weapons and the pursuit of nuclear disarmament. This is an economic argument, a strategic argument, but most importantly of all, a moral argument. And I therefore have pleasure in supporting the motion moved by my colleague Keith Brown. That concludes the debate on Trident. We now move to the next item of business. And the next item of business is consideration of business motion 10729 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number 10729. Moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion, therefore I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number 10729, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. We now come to decision time. There are three questions to be put as a result of today's business. Can I remind members that in relation to, to today's debate, if the amendment in the name of Willie Rennie is agreed, the amendment in the name of Patrick Harvey falls? The first question then is amendment number 10724.1 in the name of Willie Rennie, which seeks to amend motion number 10724 in the name of Keith Brown on Trident be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10724.1 in the name of Willie Rennie is as follows. Yes, 17. No, 68. There are 29 abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed to. The next question then is amendment number 10724.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey, which seeks to amend motion number 10724 in the name of Keith Brown on Trident be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The Parliament's not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on amendment number 10724.2 in the name of Patrick Harvey is as follows. Yes, 68. No, 47. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed to. 
The next question is at motion number 10724 in the name of Keith Brown, as amended on Trident, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The Parliament is not agreed. We move to a vote. Members should cast their votes now. The result of the vote on motion number 10724 in the name of Keith Brown as amended is as follows. Yes, 68. No, 47. There were no abstentions. The motion as amended is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We now move to members' business. Members should leave in the chamber, should do so quickly and quietly.